Hello. So we are live here with Nick Baxter and uh, Guy Atchison. Uh, Nick is going to be presenting uh, the basics of landscape oil painting. And if you are at reinventingthetattoo.com or if you're on the mobile app, then if you don't see the image that he's got below uh, your video, then you can refresh or go back and forth and you'll get to it. Um, yes, this is beaming through Reinventing the Tattoo Community. If you are, uh, go to your mobile app uh, store of choice and search for Reinventing the Tattoo, um, you'll find the app. Thank you very much for tuning in. Um, I'm going to make a couple announcements while this is streaming out through the different uh, YouTubes and Facebooks. So we want to thank, um, let's see here, go through some of these YouTube streams. We've got the Tattoo Television YouTube stream, which is working. We've got uh, the, oh, look at this. How about enable start here? Oh, or click. Oh, nope, that's going to, yeah, okay, let's see here, uh, Reinventing the Tattoo, so we actually have a new YouTube channel that is the Reinventing the Tattoo YouTube channel. Uh, we've had a couple other ones, but we have just started this one up fresh, so please go and give that one a subscribe. And then uh, Fireside Tattoo Network is also streaming this out tonight. So we want to thank uh, Fireside Tattoo Network, and actually Nick has a webinar available so if uh, you dig what he's got going on, it's a 15% holiday coupon code for Nick's Still Life Painting Course. Uh, if you go to firesidetattoo.com, uh, grab that course. It's special treat it is the coupon code. And we want to thank them for yeah, sharing it out. And let me check the uh, Facebooks. We want to thank the tattoos.com Facebook, the... Uh, TattooEducation.com, Facebook, yeah, look like it's looks like it's going out all over the place. Hyperspace Studios, Guy Aitchison, and uh, okay, so I guess the last thing I want to do before we get started is thank our oh, I, we have a whole schedule here. Holy Moses, okay, um, this is the Sunday night art jams. We've been doing these at nine o'clock pretty much uh, every Sunday night. Um, the uh, next event that we have coming up is uh, Monday morning, 9 o'clock in the morning. We've got the Hashtag Reinventing Drawing Group with Jake Meeks from the Fireside Tattoo Network. Uh, artists beam in and do their drawings and homework, and they're a lot of fun. You can check out a lot of the replays. They're fun to put on in the background. At noon on Mondays, we have Let's Talk Tattoo with Mark Lascarbo from Needle Jig, doing interviews and demos and all sorts of fun stuff. As always, Monday night, Guy Aitchison's Reinventing the Tattoo subscribers meet. These are We have a lot of these free events that we put out, uh, thanks to the sponsors. The subscribers pay for the Reinventing the Tattoo curriculum, which is a vast wealth of uh, tattoo knowledge. If you go to reinventingthetattoo.com and subscribe, then yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll check it out. It'll be worth it. You'll hear people talking about it left and right. Um, so it's a holiday week here, so we skip forward to December 27th at 1 o'clock. Next Sunday is another uh, uh, hashtag reinventing drawing group and, uh, led by Jason Lesser. We did that today, and it was, it was a lot of fun. Sunday uh, afternoons are a lot of uh, tattooers days off, so that was great. And then the last event for this year that we have scheduled is the first global biomech party. And uh, maybe... Uh, this would be a good time for Guy. Oh, wait, no, no. I'll, maybe Guy will I'll talk about that. It's, uh, I'm sure we'll talk about it, but it, I want to say that's on the 27th and at 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern. And then I want to thank our sponsors real quick, and then I could pass this along. Um, thank you very much to Inkjet Stencils, inkjetstencils.com, and they have a pretty awesome uh, printer. It's a continuous ink printer that prints out stencils, so you, 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 know, you work on your designs digitally. And then you can make the stencils. Uh, they print out. Uh, Andre Malcolm just printed out a back piece. He has like an oversized printer, and he, and he printed out a whole full back piece in a sheet. Um, you can find a video of that on the Reinventing app. Search for uh, Andre. And uh, yeah, the other uh, sponsor I want to mention for for this is uh, Cheyenne Tattoo has a, a full tattoo machine that is being raffled off. And I suppose we'll do it before the end of the year. So, tattooeducation.com/slash giveaway 
uh, it's the it's a vetting form, so you have to put in your tattoo shop information, and if you're already vetted, still uh, put in the entry again so that we know that you are interested in this Cheyenne machine. Tattooeducation.com slash giveaway. Okay, I am going to disappear. I will be monitoring a lot of the chat rooms, so I might uh, pop in to uh, relay some messages, but other than that, I'm just going to test and make sure everything's working. Thank you very much. Okay, woo! All right, well, hey, uh, Everyone, welcome. Uh, we've got Nick here. Nick, are you uh, around? Yeah, um, I should right. be live. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, yes. Can I can hear you loud and clear. I can see your awesome. setup. Uh, we've got Nick, uh, who uh, I doubt any of you really needs an intro uh, introduction to Nick Baxter, but uh, <laughs> I'll say for the record that he's, ever since he showed up on the scene, you know, 25-ish years ago, I guess it's been, uh, you know, people noticed Nick right away because he was doing some things differently, but it made sense. And uh, he's always been that way. He's, he's uh, always got a little bit of a different twist, but when you see it, it's like, ah, oh, okay, that totally makes sense. And, uh, and he can tell you exactly why too. He's very uh, uh, thoughtful about the, the way he uh, goes about tattooing and painting. And uh, uh, anyone who follows him, I'm sure has read some of the captions uh, with some of his posts. Uh, always interesting stuff. So Nick, thank you for joining us here tonight. Uh, thanks for having me. Great about painting with you. Yeah, thanks, man. Appreciate being here. So uh, what have we got going on here? You're uh, working on a, a fairly small panel there. Yeah, the size is uh, five by seven inches. And it it's, I, I chose that size basically just so I can finish this painting in the in the course of this live stream too. yep and i see you've got a, a reference uh up on your ipad there uh, yeah that's I, a yeah, that's a sunset beach scene that i photographed so um you can if anyone wants to paint along with me and use that same image you can you, you can download it off the reinventing the tattoo website uh it's been uploaded Nice. And so, of course, uh, we're encouraging people to either paint this. Uh, obviously, if you paint this image, uh, you'll be able to take the most kind of direct instruction from Nick um, because he'll he'll be telling you point by point what he's doing. And uh, I imagine some of you are probably uh, more or less already fully prepared, having read all the material ahead of time and, and the, the list. And you've got your palette laid out. Uh, uh, in my own case, since I don't want a lot of unfinished paintings stacking up from these uh, um, workshops, I've got a, an unfinished painting that's got a sunset in it. And I thought uh, I'd like to try to bring the sunset to life and, and try to take as much as I can from uh, what Nick is, uh, is doing here, um, color scheme wise, and in terms of luminosity and that sort of thing, I'd like to, to see if I can uh, pick up a little bit of that mojo. So Nick, you're working with a relatively simple palette, right? Just basically some browns and the primaries and not much else, right? Yeah, this is, this is kind of like a modified palette for landscapes. Um, just includes some of my most common colors I find myself always using when I paint landscapes. So I've got burnt umber, raw umber. So that's a, a, a warm brown, a cool brown, ultramarine blue, alizarin crimson, sap green, burnt sienna, uh, chromium oxide green, yellow ochre, cadmium yellow, buff titanium, and um, titanium white. And then my uh, mixing medium, just, just some oil, some uh, linseed oil. Yeah. Um, so with linseed oil, do you find that uh, some colors dry at a radically different rate than others? Has that ever been an issue for you? The browns, so, so any earthen colors like uh, brown, um, any browns will dry a lot faster than some of the, some of the man-made colors um, or some of the more oily colors. So. Yeah, if you just add linseed oil to everything across the board, it'll kind of even out the drying rate and make it all viscous enough to move around. 
And what is, uh, is that pretty much your every time kind of medium, uh, linseed? And what is the reason for your preference? You know, linseed's just your basic oil medium. Um, you can do anything you want to do with it. And so um, it's just kind of like your, your basic no frills medium. It's widely available. It's easy to work with. And you can get more fancy, more exotic types of oils and mixtures to work with. Um, to produce certain working results you, you, that you may want. Um, so you, you could have like a fast drying medium or a slower drying medium or, you know, s something more exotic that might have less yellowing or, or, you know, I think walnut oil is dries a lot clearer over time. So there's all kinds of different mediums that you can use, but linseed oil is going to allow you to do everything you want to do. All right. Well, uh, uh, Gabe, have we got Nick pinned so that uh, he's visible through the whole conversation? I just, uh, he, he, yeah, he's visible for everything. Do you want to split screen it or just uh, have him on? Oh, I mean, if, if I'm like little on the screen, that's fine. But I think mostly people are going to be interested in, in seeing what he's showing. Uh, cool. He's, uh, he's uh, featured right now. Okay. And uh, I've got a, a whole mess of... Uh, chat room uh, messages if uh, you want to let me read some off here. I've got... Uh, sure, sure. Uh, Let's see who's here. Okay, so first up from the uh, Reinventing crew, that's probably on the mobile app here, uh, or on reinventing.com, we've got uh, Jason. Uh, first up, uh, Casey Ball says, I'm in. Hey, everyone. Uh, Jason's here. Tivon's here. He's still setting up, but he's excited for this. Matt Jackson says, hey, guys. Leo Gonzalez says, howdy. Melissa Sink says, evening all. Yeah, let's see here. Who else we've got? Then uh, Bruno's on the YouTube channels says, oh, he's got a, a cheers, uh, uh, horns, and a uh, a uh, funny grin emoji. <laughs> Let's see. Um, and then on the Facebooks, we've got Angel Rivera says, greetings from Tijuana guy. And then uh, Rock James Deveren says, got to watch guy work at a tattoo convention in San Diego in Cali 1994. It was still illegal in Massachusetts then. And uh, James McClellan uh, says, what's up? Uh, Pancho says, hello from Soranara Desert Brothers. Okay. Um, oh, Christopher Zangi uh, tagged Dan Marshall, who's awesome. And then Jordan Lee Rukas says, as an emoji, that's too small for me to read out. Anyways, thanks again for everybody for watching. It's a perfect time to share it around so that... Uh, yeah, more people can watch, and we'll, uh, I'll be in the back in the background. I'll tell you what, if we could ever get Dan Marshall to do a watercolor demonstration for us, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people who would love that. So, uh, all right, Nick, you are, it looks like you're mixing your, uh, your blue gradient uh, range there. Uh, Want to tell us where we're at with your preparation? Yeah, so um, I have a gessoed panel, and... When you first joined the chat, I don't know, you may have noticed me just uh, going back and forth with a brush. I was, I was putting oil over the entire surface of the panel. So the, this entire panel has a thin, very thin coat of uh, linseed oil medium on it right now that will help my paint um, slide off my brush very easily and make for some really nice smooth gradients. You know, yeah. It extends the working time of the paint, basically. It keeps it open and loose and sliding around longer. It also is a way to, you know, I always thought of it as just instead of mixing the oil or the medium on the palette and then applying it to the panel, that by just having the medium waiting there on the panel, uh, you're just doing the dilution of the paint differently, but you end up with a similar mix that you would, but with less laboring. Yes, uh, exactly. 
the medium on the panel will just grab the paint directly off your brush and even a tiny amount, just a few molecules of color on your brush, you can work quite a bit. Yep, that's a good way to put it. It makes your painting process way more efficient. And so that's always a good thing. So it looks like you're mixing colors for the water surface there. Um, um, I'm mixing sky colors right now, okay. so, but of course well, the sky is going to be reflected in the water, so it's all the same. Yeah, yeah. the water surface, I'm just looking at the value of it really, and um, this is the part that my colorblind self is always mystified by, because I mean, I can tell if it matches or not, kind of, you know, mostly, but in order to like make it match, that's where I struggle, I just don't know what to put together to get each color, and uh, you know, I can get a kind of a broad scatter shot approximation that's good enough but uh yeah well uh, i mean in terms of landscape painting in, in particular it's such a forgiving genre because there's so there's a vast range and variety of what um of what our earth does you know as in terms of light and atmosphere so yeah very and, true that I'm too. So, uh, yeah, in addition to the people who have uh, said hi in the chat room, uh, Kaya Rose, our daughter, is painting uh, as well. And since uh, she's going to have an earlier bedtime than most of us, she's doing something that she can hammer out quick, more of a Bob Ross style landscape. And uh, she's done a lot of these, and they're all, always really cool. I don't use any reference most of the time. I just like go for it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, that's, she's, she's in the house as well. And, uh, yeah, you know what, when I'm uh, working a slightly larger panel or canvas like this one, uh, rather than oiling down the entire surface, I'm kind of doing the same thing, but instead I'm just oiling the area that I'm going to work next. Um, just so it doesn't, uh, you know, I don't have to breathe as much of it. Yeah, the thing that caused me to give up on linseed oil was, uh, I'm sure you've seen Light Form 10. It's a large sky painting with uh, really nice. vibrating kind of things going on. And, and uh, yeah. I, uh, I did an underpainting in acrylic. I was very careful not to let it build up to a glossy finish or anything like that. Uh, but uh, I had just done another light form painting with a similar blue color scheme. It was sort of an underwater microscopic thing. And it was still like in the process of drying as I was painting that one. And uh, it happened to both of them where all the blue, especially the lighter blue areas uh, it just didn't adhere. The, the oil didn't. And over the course of several years following, uh, all of that oil just kind of gathered together into these little brown boogers here and there on the surface. And, you know, whatever paint that they had carried, a lot of that kind of got gathered up with it. And uh, so, yeah, now it's going to need some restoration, unfortunately. And it's one of the reasons why, I mean, that, that particular painting is, is the main reason why I have gone almost entirely just to Alkid. It just feels like a more reliable, you know, same finish every time kind of medium. Yeah, I used to use Alkid and uh, I started to have problems with the faster drying times. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I can, I can understand that. It's, it's definitely... Uh, uh, a, a limitation and if not for the fact that um not for the fact that i'm not normally able to sit and paint for more than a couple of hours you know uh i think it would be a problem but since, since that is my current reality the two two and a half hour window is actually not bad for me uh yeah. kaya wants us to wants me to show off her painting real quick here we, here we go it's looking pretty awesome actually she's been uh doing palette knife stuff. So uh, yeah, here's hers. Uh, 
I think I might have directed you towards Lynn Bodges. Did you ever get a chance to check him out? Um, I don't remember. Okay. Sorry. Uh, you, you would. If you had seen his work, you'd remember. Uh, you know, I, I had always thought of palette knife painting as sort of a novelty before that. You know, kind of a gimmicky thing. But, uh, you know, the landscapes that he does, they're very, like, the thing that's that's neat about him is they're very human scale. Uh, he really likes creek beds, especially with a little snow, and uh, you know maybe even a little ice, but the water's still moving. And uh, he he's done well enough with his career that he's managed to buy a few hundred acres in West Virginia, and so he'll actually go out and build a a platform. Uh, with a, a roof so that you know if the snow is falling it's not gonna mess with his program yeah. and then, uh, the painting process itself is like a day and uh, man I you know I, I don't want to try to describe it verbally because <laughs> I won't do it any justice but uh, it's uh, it's got this uncanny realism that you would never expect from palette painting like the the sense of being present at that place is really strong, despite the fact that it's clearly just big gobs of paint, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. such a new thing, you know, and, and, and I love that when something can be clearly a painting, but also have a real sense of realism. Yeah. And that's like the hardest thing to do is to be simultaneously loose and precise at the same time. Yeah. Am I doing that at all? If you, it, I think that the, the big thing is, is uh, well, one of them anyway, is if you can nail your lighting. Um, because if you're super loose, but your lighting appears dead on, it's still going to have that, that realistic presence. Yeah. Yeah, our eyes and our brain are intuitively trained to recognize, you know, to have a sort of calculation of how light hits an object and if it's it, it, if it appears to have the proper dimension or not. Yeah, in fact, I think that if it doesn't, we just don't even really register it as an object. Yeah. Uh, it, but, you know, if it does to the point where, where our brain is fooled and, you know, it has, take, does that double take where you really have to stop and say, wait a minute, is that actually a painting? Uh, that's, that's, you know, success. But especially if, when you look at it, the brushwork is still really visible. And it's, it's not this in, intensely labored over thing where, where there's mine, not any visible brushwork at all. Is mine art? Uh, yeah, I love the lighting art. Um, and, uh, you know, that's to me sort of a holy grail. And, and, you know, of course, I'm nowhere near being able to do that. You know, every now and then I feel like I, I'll, I'll land you know, a few brush strokes in a, in a way where the bristles have just magically encoded a very realistic light and dark texture based on the direction of lighting that I'm trying to produce. And it's like, ah, I'm nailing it, you know, but then it's this bleeding yeah. thing and they can't always capture that. Yep. Um, a, a question in from the chat room. Jason's asking, uh, please ask Nick if he usually tints his canvas with a mid-tone or if he keeps it white before painting. For landscapes, I, I I usually don't tint it because uh, there there's some great like luminosity and kind of sunlight effects you can do with a with a bright white canvas. Like here on my reference image where I'm pointing at uh, is where the sunset is, and so um, having the white of the canvas be able to reflect through the oil and come back to your eye, it it makes it much more luminous. So I often don't tint for landscapes, but um, I have at times, and there's nothing wrong with doing so. Once you've tinted something and, and you want to have a particular feature of it be super luminous, it's sometimes hard to bring it back all the way to where it's, yeah. it's got that same reflectivity. And so there have definitely been, been projects where I've tinted most of the canvas, but then had the tinting kind of grade A up to white where or, or near white where the... Uh, light source is going to be and uh then it makes it less less difficult you don't have to to fight that underpainting nearly as much 
Yeah, if you're working from reference and you know in advance where that's going to be, you can certainly plan for it. Um, doing a lot of plain air painting, like painting on location, uh, it's you know you can't you can't usually plan for that. Right. Yeah. So just having that white canvas is your uh, kind of your most versatile answer. Yeah. Well, you can see here I've pre-mixed all my major colors. So this is called a closed palette technique, and. Uh, Closed palette just means you mix everything and you do all your color matching in advance. So now I'm just going to paint and take from all these colors. And I've, I've also kind of arranged them in the, according to where they will fall in the painting. So like my, my sky blues and then like my sunset colors in the middle. And then down here, I got these like foreground colors mixed. And then I'll add in some like pure, some pure colors that don't need to be pre-mixed as well, but any major it, uh, areas of color in my reference that I spot, I just try to like pre-mix those in piles, so it makes it easier. Yeah, well, it's it's almost like if you're a digital painter, having a a palette laid out ahead of time instead of having to just wing it and and go to the color picker and start from scratch each time you're making a, a new color, you know. But it, instead, have yeah. a a palette laid out of you know 48 sample colors or whatever. Yep, that's exactly correct uh, uh, analog, I guess, to this, um, or this is the analog to that. But um, an, an, another thing that's helpful with landscape painting is if you know you're gonna have a horizon line in your piece is to like just pre-measure a true horizontal line on your canvas. So I don't know if this shows up on my video quality, but I pre-drew some pencil lines here so I know where true horizontal is and so, that that will avoid me accidentally getting a wobbly or a tilted horizon line, which would kind of destroy the whole illusion and make it look like a snapshot that was taken off balance. Yeah. Now, one thing that I, I think is worth mentioning is that although it is nice to be able to see your reference, uh, it ends up making your panel pretty small on the screen. Yeah. And I think since since most of the people who are actively following along with you have the reference. Uh, I don't know how, you know, it, it might be uh, pixels better spent if you were to just zoom in a little bit. Uh, it is yeah. nice to see what you're doing on the palette, but uh, I don't know. I mean, you could kind of take turns. If, if there's times when you're doing a lot of stuff on the palette, I know it's kind of hard to move the camera around. Well, we still have gloves on. Well, you're uh, getting that set up. I'd like to... Uh thank people that are watching from the Fireside Tattoo Network. Uh, we have uh, That Tattoo Guy says, Hey guys, uh, Dan the Kraken 18, this is Powerful Gentleman, a uh, series of artists. Uh, you know, Dan the Kraken 18 says, This is amazing. I wish I was at home. I could paint along, but uh, you can always watch the replay and then paint along again. Uh, Mariano Lopez says, Hello all. And then Atomic Inkjet is uh, I've got an answer. Uh, Inkjet, Atomic Inkjet, uh, shoot an email to uh, Gabe at tattoonow.com. And um, yeah, the reinventing app actually is a different login, it's not the same as the web page. Um, they will uh, work together, but currently the app is a new login. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Billy Narian says, Good morning from Scotland. Oh, morning. Uh, Phil Kelly says hello from Portland, Oregon. Mong Salzar says hello from the Philippines. Allison Darnell says Lo love this exclamation point. Love this. Um, okay, maybe a couple more here. Maybe not. Let's see here. Uh, Savannah Popoff Griggs, what type of oil paint do you prefer? Hey, okay, Susanna. Um, my usual. Two brands are either Gamblin or uh, Natural Pigments. Natural Pigments. So th that's actually the name of the brand. Yeah, I guess that's the name of the website. But their their brand is Rublev. Okay. That's Rublev, and this is Gamblin.
Yeah, and I think that you you've been uh, probably thinking a lot more specifically about your your paint choices th- than I have. I've just been for a long time working with that whatever's lying around because uh, I'm just making stuff, right? I'm not trying to make a, a realistic landscape most of the time. Uh, although you know, I'm I'm thinking that I'd like to uh, start painting skies i might have mentioned that when i talked to you earlier i really would like to just every now and then paint the sky especially uh you know that that half hour before sundown and and really just try to learn to hammer it out loose as can be but to to try to get those colors because i feel like even though i'm colorblind uh i can i can have a meaningful you know uh experience with it you know uh Yes. Recently, we had uh, uh, Fawn Baker and uh, uh, Jordan Rukas were, were here and uh, a couple of months ago when we were looking at the sky, it was uh, the sun had just dropped below the horizon and there's this this gradient. And, you know, I'm always doubting myself. And that's one of the things I hate about this, because, you know, I do live in a full color world. It's just, you know, I flunk all the color tests. <laughs> and so I, uh, I asked them, you know, what do you guys think of that, that color gradient on near the horizon? You know, do you actually see color there? It's sort of silvery, but, uh, I, you know, I'm seeing hints of stuff. And so we kind of compared notes and, and, you know, it seemed like we were on the same page. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's sometimes it's so subtle that you're just seeing, you know, micro hints of these colors. And yeah. that's a very, very tricky thing uh, when you're trying to paint it and really capture it. Yeah, it's the difference between light and pigment. You know, like light is color, is a different form of color than pigmented color. So. Right, right. Yeah, you actually use different uh, colors in, you know, RGB versus CMYK. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I guess that's one of the reasons why uh, some artists like to work really translucent and, and let that white uh, bounce uh, light back through the layer of pigment because then you actually are getting more light uh, when you're looking at it. Yeah, and glazing, you know, that's where glazing comes in. So, um, you know, like you need to do an indirect painting style where you let it one layer dry and then you do a translucent oily layer on top of that one and that's when you can really start to get close to those atmospheric effects where you're seeing through um, particles of oxygen, in, in, you know, in our air, that's what creates atmosphere. And um, so you're seeing through sort of particles of color and oil when, when, when you start to glaze and that's the closest you can get to manufacturing the amazingness that, you know, the natural world can, can do. Yeah. I, uh, I guess I'd, I'd be curious to know like exactly what you're doing first here now that you're actually painting. Yeah, I'm just laying in basic shapes. So I started with my horizon line um, just to get that established. So and now I'm just mapping in the, the uh, distant landforms and I'll work my way you know, in, into the foreground then I'll piece the sky in. Um, so given that this reference doesn't have a lot of interaction between foreground and sky, I can work out of order, but um, often it's better to work from farthest away to closest just to keep things organized. But since I've already pre-mixed all my colors on palette, I can just, and in my reference, there's very little interaction between each like layer of, of or area of the painting. I can just kind of block in the different shapes as I see fit. Right, your foreground background progression is pretty linear where you don't have overlapping far foreground shapes uh, coming in front of the far background. Yeah, exactly. So I can kind of work out of order the way I'm doing it right now. I've got a question in here. Uh, Susanna popoff Griggs asks, do you uh, find you limit your palette the longer you paint or do you use more and more color? Um, I don't know. I'm kind of all over the place. That I, I mean, I I feel like th- these colors I have laid out are are a lot of colors for some artists. Um, for many artists, that would be like way too complex of a of a palette. But 
for me, this is like a stripped down palette. So, uh, yeah, some you know, some artists work with these so called triads, where you know basically it's like the the RGB idea. You know, having having three, uh, you know, complementary colors that uh, you know. I mean, the the common ones would be you know red, yellow, and blue, the primaries, but. Uh, it doesn't have to be that, you know, it can often be like alizarin, ochre, and uh, Haynes Gray, you know, and uh, with that, you can end up creating something that looks pretty realistic, but it's got a mood to it because it's, it's based on this very particular palette that doesn't necessarily give you the full gamut, you know, it gives you a, a very rich gamut, but it does not give you the full gamut, which is why you end up with a, a mood. Like a lot of filmmakers, they'll they'll have a limited gamut in their entire film, where the the palette is a really big part of the psychology of the, the movie. Yeah, there's something called a Zorn palette, Z O R N, I, I believe, and uh, that's like a classical Euro European painting palette, and it's it's only like three four colors, and there's been some incredible paintings done with only those three and four colors and you would never know it was that simple hasn't gunner talked a little bit about the zorn palette I yeah think. i think he had yeah so, so Susanna kind of was following that up a little bit i, I watched you paint a, a long time ago in paradise and you seem to be very precise i'm curious if you've found yourself simplifying over the years Similar question. Uh, short answer, no. <laughs> but I um, mean, I've, as I stretch myself as a painter and attempt new things and kind of advance and progress myself, I find value in the situations where I can be more simple. But, you know, that occurs within a larger practice of painting where I do many complex things as well. So it's just situational. You know, I don't think there's one just, true, true best way to paint. I think just based on, on Nick's vocabulary, you can tell he's not somebody that seeks simplicity deliberately. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of guilty of the same. Uh, Preston Hines uh, says, I appreciate this. Uh, oils are intimidating. Maybe you have uh, any tips for people that might be a little intimidated by oils? Start, start simple uh, and do, just learn the materials first, really. So don't even try to paint pictures at first if it's too intimidating to paint a picture. Like literally just smear paint around on, on a canvas or just try, to, just try to match a color. Just maybe take like an article of clothing and then put it next to your canvas and then just try to match that color. Or just, you know, the, the color of anything, just like learn to mix paint. There's actually a really great uh, course that Matt Hurtado did and Gabe can tell you where to access it, but it's uh, just painting a cube, you know, very straightforward, but, uh, but trying to, you know, make a nice looking cube of it. And, uh, you know, it, it takes this very simple shape and gives you a, a chance to really develop it to the point where, you know, you have a, an opportunity to work the paint without having this um, kind of, overwhelming uh set of objectives that you know you're just not ready for yeah the biggest mistake everyone makes and like i mean everyone is that you want to learn a new medium or you know so, so let's say oil, oil painting so you buy all your supplies you buy this big expensive canvas you spend all your money and then you pick out like the most advanced like artistic thing you've ever wanted to paint that's got to be a masterpiece and then you fail miserably it's like why would you jump to step 10 when there's like steps one through nine? Yeah, but that's, that's true. And, and also the size thing, it's very easy to think, Oh, it's a painting, you know? So I, I don't have to think like a tattoo artist. Finally, you know, I'll, I'll get this two by three foot canvas here and you are a tattoo artist. And so you have just taken on a back piece. Yeah. And what will happen is because you're new to painting, your technique is going to keep getting better in the course of that one project. 
and you're going to look at stuff you did three days ago and be like, oh, crap, I have to go back over there that again, because now I've already kind of gotten better than that and moved beyond it. And so then you're going through the, the whole painting over and over again. It gets discouraging. And uh, so uh, definitely start small and simple and uh, tune into to an instructional stuff when you can. Uh, yeah, the Nick Baxter. I mean, the, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Matt Hurtado thing is highly recommended there's also a a skull painting uh with with sean barber that shouldn't be your first painting that you ever try but uh once you've done a few of them you've done the matt hurtado thing you're starting to to get a sense of control over it that would be a good you know 10th painting we also have uh the uh christina ramos with the donut oh the donut yeah the donut you know again that's that's up there in the 10th painting kind of range but uh yeah that one was a lot of fun and uh, the other one that we did over the summer was uh uh the eye with joe harrison that oh yeah to be yeah. The next one to... yeah that's also a great exercise that you can do over and over again just to get a photograph of your eye or somebody else's eye up close and uh the thing about when you paint something like an eye or you know any human like a hand anything like that you can tell if you've done it right or not you know anybody can without even having to have any expertise and uh you know you're not going to be ready for that kind of of challenge right away you know you might end up feeling like you're just making mud and uh, in fact, that's, that's you know, obviously the big challenge. So Nick, I guess that would be my next question for you is what are some strategies that you use to avoid making mud while you're painting? Um, my, my main one is I have application brushes and then I have blending brushes. And so uh, you keep your brushes separated and clean. So that's, so that's number one. Don't just pick one brush and try to try do everything with it. Like put the paint on with one brush and then put that brush down and then move it around with another brush. Yeah, also uh, something that I find helps uh, is to have a, a paper towel that's taped down a rel relatively big area of it if it's a bigger painting uh, that you can just easily clean without having to use both hands you'll keep your brush cleaner if it's easier to clean it. Yeah, yeah, like right, right here, I, I, I cut up old t-shirts in, into rags. And so, um, you know, just I'll always have old t-shirts and rags laying around. I can always just clean my brush off real easy. Gets most of the paint off. There's still some, re some residual on the bristles, but um, it, you know, that's all you really need to do in most cases, unless you're doing something very, very luminous and, you know, primary color. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think probably the best way to avoid mud in any medium is to just have an idea of what you're doing ahead of time, have a good plan. Um, if you know where your darks and lights are going to be, then there shouldn't have to be too much of a wrestling match between the two where you're trying to put highlights over dark areas uh, yeah. and that kind of thing. Uh, as, as a tattooer, you already are familiar with you know, highlights that you're having to leave negative from the start, right? Because you can't just put white over black. Right. Uh, if you kind of approach painting in a similar way, uh, you're going to have a little bit cleaner process. It's not going to get muddy as easily. Uh, let's see, uh, Cody uh, Heavenridge says, hi from Lakeland, Florida. I used to work with Litos. You guys are great. And then, uh, let's see, Susanna, uh, Susanna asks, uh, speaking of, does Nick enjoy uh, keeping painting and tattooing separate? Guy integrates both. Uh, I know some artists like keeping them separate. I don't, I don't understand the question. I guess in terms of like, uh, you know, your, your painting subject matter being very different, you know, yes. by and large from your tattoo subject matter. Yes. Although, okay. You, know, you do paint. Yeah, that makes sense. You tattoo, you tattoo landscapes sometimes and that kind of thing. Yep. But they're, they're different looking from your paintings. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's, it's like two different parts of my brain, really. So I kind of enjoy being able to do different things with each, although it, it is fun sometimes to bring it together. But yeah, it's two different disciplines for me. It's two different parts of my brain and two different things that I find fun. It's like, you know, like dessert tastes good and dinner tastes good, but you wouldn't like mash it all into one thing. So that's how that's how it kind of is for me. Although people like like guy or, or others just you know it's all just dessert <laughs> <laughs> yeah well yes and no the, the big difference for me between tattooing and painting is the context tattooing is where i am gladly accepting uh input from others and in fact i i prefer it usually uh and painting is where I'm not and don't want to and have no interest in that. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's my personal artistic place. And so apart from that, subject matter wise, in both tattooing and painting, I'm just doing the stuff that I like, right? And, yeah. you know, so it all ends up kind of being similar stuff, but, you know, at the same time, maybe I'm just kind of falling prey to my defaults. And so there's a part of me that really wants to uh, make an effort to reach outside of the comfort zone and, and, uh, you know, learn these other, these other things, you know, like painting Christina's donut and that, that kind of thing. I think that's really important that regardless of what you want to specialize in, you, uh, you do these, these classic uh, things to, to see, see how it'll turn out in your hand what you can learn from it yeah i like what you said about just doing what you like and my problem is i like too many things yeah i'm just interested in a lot of things and i have a very active brain i guess and so i'm just like ooh, what if i did this oh like what if i tattooed this way oh what if i painted this subject matter like you know i, I paint like you know kind of grotesque kind of weird surrealist stuff and then i'll just paint like classical landscapes it's like there's no rhyme or reason to it. It's just, I'm into everything. Right. Yep. Like the kid in the candy store. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you're also like me and that you have whole catalogs of ideas that you'll probably never even get to because, you know, it's hard to narrow it down. You have to narrow it down. And some, some things yeah. just end up, you know, realistically not, not being in the, in the queue. Yep. Lately, I've been trying to like mash them all together in, 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 in my painting, at least, and do like kind of surrealist stuff that incorporates landscape, incorporates still life, incorporates grotesque, like all of it. Just try to put it all, put it all into one incomprehensible, I don't know, eye, eye feast. Yeah, well, OK, so one, one example would be and this is included in the encyclopedia you know it was one of those surgical things but they were cutting the landscape open yeah right yeah that yeah. was an example of, of uh mashing a few of those things together because the landscape was pretty realistic yeah exactly and i've done crazier stuff than that lately as well so yeah that's basically it just Two all over the place, but actually trying to harness it all into one, one thing. I uh, put up guys painting there for a little bit while you were talking, and uh, Pres uh, Preston Hines says that looks sick, guy. Oh, thanks. Maybe if uh, people that are painting while they watch, let it let us know in the in the chat room uh, if you're painting. And at some point, it will uh, be fun to know who's, uh, who's, who's doing this. So, yeah, Kaya has finished her painting. And as long as you're showing mine, let me just put hers on the screen. Uh, and this has got some really nice, thick impasto on it. Boom. Nice. That's awesome. A little touch of pink in the sky and... Uh, yeah, some nice gradients in there. Yeah, hell yeah. Yeah, we're trying to encourage her to just hammer through the 
canvas panels, you know, not be uh, precious about it. And so she's, she's routinely doing, you know, sometimes a painting a day or more. It's, it's amazing watching her keep up. Yeah, she'll be an incredible artist at, at you know, a, a much earlier age. It's a, a big part of our homeschool is uh, being creative. My number one piece of advice to anyone out there who's you know, either homeschooling or distance learning right now, or, or even, you know, not, but your kids are, you're, you're wanting to encourage them to be creative. Uh, just make sure they've got a really nice creative setup in their space. And every now and then, without saying anything about it, just go over there and clean it up, add a couple of new things, drop a new sketchbook in there, some new art supplies, organize it, make it look inviting and just quietly walk away and, uh, you know, maybe do that once a month. And uh, yeah, the magic will just happen. All right, so let's go back to Nick. I'd like to see how oh, he's yeah, uh, blending his colors now. Now he's start to, starting to get some uh, paint on the canvas there, yeah. so. Looks like you're going uh, all your darks first. And what have we got there? You've made kind of like some neutral earthy colors with uh, uh, what a dark blue and an uh, umber or something like that. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of grays in, in, this, in this foreground. That, you know, that there's a lot of gray, so you can make that with blue and brown and white. So I'm just trying to get this basically like roughed in and then um, you, you can refine to your heart's content. But if you get it roughed in accurately, then it'll look like it's supposed to look. And then however much you want to develop it from there into like fine detail realism is up to you. So I'm just getting everything established and correct basically according to the reference. Uh, Brandon Stone on the uh, Fireside Tattoo Network YouTube asks, do you, do you guys like to use Liquin or Galkid, or do you stick to linseed oil? Well, we did talk about that a little bit earlier. Uh, Nick is using lin, uh, linseed, and I am using Liquin. Uh, and, uh, yeah, if you want to go back to the, the replay, we definitely talked in, in some detail about our, the reasons for our preferences. But it, really, it's down to drying time. Cool. And then, uh, well, uh, we're on the Fireside Tattoo Network. Uh, Nick has a webinar up there. And Jake said that there's a 15% off holiday coupon code. So if you're interested in Nick's Still Life painting course, it's code special treat at firesidetattoo.com. And uh, Jake was in the uh, chat room earlier. Don't know if he's still there, but hello, he is doing his drawing group. The, the hashtag reinventing drawing group is tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. Um, okay, I'm, I'm in the background again. All right. Uh, thanks, Jake. And uh, yeah, looking forward to your drawing group tomorrow. And of course, it's eight o'clock here and I'm going to be up till three tonight. So who knows, but I'm going to try to drop in. So with the uh, pre-oiled panel like that, and you know it being a panel uh, as opposed to a canvas, so you don't have all those tiny little nooks uh, that the, the grain of the canvas normally uh, provides, do you ever find that the brush kind of scrapes off paint as well as puts it on? You end up with these little white lines uh, being created by the bristles. Um. Yeah, that does happen, but uh, if you if you know the right you know viscosities to mix your paint, and you're and you're using the right kind of soft bristle brushes, uh, you can definitely like avoid it. 
plus the right hand motions, I guess, too. So, um, you know, like you can see what I'm doing here is like everything's very like, I don't know, I, I don't, I'm not like stabbing down on the painting. I'm like laying it on the, on, on the sides of the bristles. So I'm, I'm really just like depositing as much paint down as possible. So you're gliding. Gliding, yeah. yeah. If it starts to kind of smear off and get too thin, then I just reload my brush and put it on even thicker, so. But some of those scratchy lines where the panel shows through is great for like foreground grasses, uh, like little textural elements in a landscape painting. Just get out your stiffer bristle brush for those and yeah, it's or just be less careful. Yeah, just be just bear bear down harder with your with, with your hand and kind of jam the paint in there a little more. But all, all the painting I've done so far is very very light. I'm I'm barely putting any pressure onto the canvas at all. I'm I'm just barely gliding these bristles on there, so the paint gets deposited but not scraped off. Is that, I can't tell from this distance, is that more of a square or is it a filbert? Um, this is a, a flat, so okay, yep. yeah, so not a filbert, it's just flat, it's just chopped off. Yep. I've got a couple questions in here from the Hyperspace Studios Facebook. Um, Roberto Roberto Palacios says, greetings, Nick. And then uh, Susanna is asking, uh, who are your favorite painters, Nick? Um, let's see, I got, I got these books right next to me here. You can't see them, they're off screen, but uh, favorite painters, of course, Dali, all the classics, My, Michelangelo, um, anyone from the Renaissance or uh, Baroque, uh, Caravaggio, um, more more modern would be Andrew Wyeth, uh, Marilyn Minter, Dolly I already mentioned. Um, pretty much anyone in the realism genre, I guess. Um, the as far as landscapes, since that's what we're doing now, um, the Hudson River School would be my my all time favorite landscape painters. Yeah, Wyeth is. I've always really enjoyed his his paintings. They're uh, realistic, but not. You know, it's again we were talking about that before that that place where you can tell that it's a painting, but the uh, the sense of presence and realism is is there. And in his case, a very uh, kind of emotional sort of. Uh, I, I'm not even sure how he does it. There's there's a kind of nostalgia attached to these images. Yeah, and I'm I'm always shocked at how geometrically simple they are. Like he'll have he'll he'll have just it almost looks like an abstract. There's just like these geometric shapes. If you look at his compositions, it'll it'll just be like like the point of a house, you know, will form like a triangle that's almost a silhouette, but not quite. And then like, you know, the land, like a hillside would just be like this curving, arcing kind of shape that if you squint your eyes, it looks like an abstract. But when you open your eyes, it's very realistic. Right. And I'm always amazed at how uh, a very realistic painting like that can have so many shapes that are just simple silhouettes. It's very little uh, detail at all on them. But, you know, of course, there's a lot of real life that we see that way. We just don't think of it that way. In our mind, we know there's actually detail. Yeah. I, uh, I copied down a lot of those names. Uh, we're, we're adding to the art history folder and reinventing uh, once or twice a week now. And uh, I can't wait. We, we want to find somebody to do, uh, you know, maybe a, an hour show a month on uh, dissecting some of the uh, awesome painters and, and masters that are out there. 
you know, I, I didn't get to go to art school, but uh, I was fortunate that even though my parents are not artists, uh, they really put it in front of, of the three of the, us kids. And um, they subscribed to this series that was being sold by our local grocery store, uh, The Great Artists. And, you know, it was, it was the familiar names. Um, but each of these volumes was pretty, pretty thin, like a magazine. Uh, big pages, really nice big pages, large color plates, and it would show each painting across from a paragraph or two about what was going on in that artist's life and in the culture around them at the time that painting was done. And often you'd hear about how the this artist was flat and broke or, or whatever, and uh, uh, how this particular piece, which became so pivotal in, in our culture, so extremely well known, was just absolutely vilified at the time. And people just were shocked at, at how it didn't follow the rules and, and just wanted to burn it. And uh, so, you know, as like a 12 year old reading this stuff, I found that so fascinating. And uh, um, the struggles that we go through now are, you know, obviously it's hard to be an artist, uh, but gosh, uh, as tattoo artists, having a steady paycheck um, you have no idea how fortunate you are. Yep, that is the truth. We, we, have, we have it better than we want to believe we have it. That's for sure. Yeah, of course, I, uh, I did a little bit of that starving artist thing before getting my apprenticeship. So I, I definitely got to get that taste. I think many of us did. Yeah, when I got my apprenticeship, I was washing dishes at an old folks home and cleaning houses. I was like, you know, like a cleaning person. Yeah. Well. And just saving all my money to be able to do tattooing. And so I would go like dumpster diving for food. And, you know, like you, you, you can get a lot of like almost stale bagels out of like, you know, the local bagel shop dumpster that were like, still like wrapped in the packaging but thrown away yeah right right yeah i never quite did that but uh i was <laughs> sleeping on the floor of a print shop at the time i got my apprenticeship this print shop owner was letting me uh stay there and uh at night i could use the copy machine and other stuff in exchange for me helping him fix the place up and, and do basic graphic art for uh, some of his customers. And uh, I managed to squeeze out an album cover. And this is, you know, I used to get paid so badly, but for, for this one, I got 750 whole dollars. And I thought, so oh, maybe I could get an apartment now. Nah. And I uh, went and got tattooed. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's when I got my apprenticeship. So it was clearly the, the right decision, right? Always that's the right decision. Go, go get tattooed. That's the answer. But yeah, uh, the first time I remember doing a walk-in and the... Uh, I did this piece, you know, I'm all nervous and jittery. I did kind of a shaky job on, on some of it, but uh, you know, it was my first walk in and the guy leaves and the boss closes the, the shop and um, takes me into the back and hands me a spliff and $72 and 50 cents. I'm like, or whatever, $37 and 50 cents. I'm like, what, what's this? He's like, this is your, pay for getting for doing the tattoo and i was like oh right that part because you know up until then i was just living and breathing it and uh yeah it was uh um and it was just such a shock to remember oh yeah right i, I am gonna make a living doing this yeah. 
Okay, so I, I need to forewarn you that I am going to have to step away. And every Sunday night I have this happen. Uh, I do want to read to my daughter every night and uh, put her to bed. So this might be the time that we could uh, let a few people in uh, on the Zoom link, some of our regular members. Uh, uh, Nick, would you be down with that? Yeah, whatever. I'm not, I'm not the most talkative person, I guess. So, Well, you know what? Our, our group are very quiet too you know what i mean everyone's going to want to hear what you have to say but uh um it's uh yeah usually about halfway into something like this it's it's nice to start getting some other voices in the mix and uh um when i get back to to this i would love to see what you're doing up a little closer um or i don't know if, if maybe you could just show us real quick if there's some way uh here's my here's a question is that like really fixed down to your easel or can you easily take it off and just no I, I can easily take this panel off the, the problem is it's five by seven inches so like you, you got to be like right on top of the camera like this to really see right it. yeah yeah if you could just do that for a second so we could just see it and get a sense of your progress because uh we can kind of see what you're doing but not in detail ah uh, yeah okay so you're really smoothing out the water surface and uh, you can see how it's uh, got that creamy sky color in there, but it's not as bright as it's going to be in the sky. Yeah, the water is always going to obviously reflect the sky, but not as brightly. So that's kind of like a rule, a general safe rule. Yeah. With, with landscapes. There's always ex exceptions because there's so many amazing, unique things that atmospheric light does but for as a general safe rule just use the same colors at, you know in in the water that were in the sky and just like dull them out a little bit and you'll probably be good yeah and of course there's going to be a slightly different texture to it as well and and you know in in the case of, of the landscape you're doing it's a fairly serene scene so it's not uh you know, especially off in the distance, there's not a lot of like visible chop or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, this water is actually kind of challenging. I'm having to just make a lot of simplifications right now and I'll come back to it later, but I'm just trying to match accurate color at the moment. Best I can anyways. Do you ever find that you have to lift some of the paint back off the canvas if, if you haven't gotten close enough with the color or do you just keep adding paint until you get where you need it? Usually I paint thin enough uh, with my technique that I can just keep adding, but um, yeah, subtracting is definitely a good technique if you, if you need to use it. So do we have anyone joining us yet or uh, has the zoom link gone out yet Gabe I have uh, put the zoom link into the uh, chat room so we'll see if uh, the regulars there uh, of course you don't have to be regular either uh, anyone who is painting with us tonight uh, please join us uh, even if especially if it's your first time and uh, if you're not an experienced painter, don't be shy. You got nothing to be embarrassed about. Uh, you are among people who are coming here for education, a lot of us. And uh, the fact that uh, you're here painting is the only thing that's important. I think that that's something that really slows people down, especially in tattooing, because we want to look impressive all the time to our peers. And so, you know, it's almost like a risk to do something that you, you're not already pretty good at in any kind of public way at all. But uh, we encourage that here. Okay, so Melissa and Sandy are in. Leo's beaming in. All right. Matt Jackson's beaming in. Oh, we had a pretty, we had good, a pretty good 
Uh, we got the echo. Somebody's got to turn their uh, sound off on uh, whatever window. And headphones. Want. Headphones are also preferable. But if, if you, you can't, can. we'll just deal with it. All right. Welcome, everybody. I'm going to step away and uh, read to this kid for a few minutes, and I'll be rejoining you guys shortly. Cool. K Casey Ball's going to uh, join after his loud ass roommate leaves. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Leo, you want to uh, introduce yourself? Uh, we'll go around the room a little bit. Or the hey, virtual room. Leo Gonzalez here. Thanks, Nick, for uh, hosting this. It's really cool. Thanks for being here, man. For sure. Leo, you want to let uh, people know how they could find you? Or find your art? Yeah, I'm... Uh... On Instagram, um, I go under Cthulio, C-T-H-U-L-E-O. Um, my website is uh, leogonzalez.com, L-E-O-G-O-N-V-A-L-E-S.com. I would do one. Um, uh, Matt, uh, Matt Jackson's here. Um, could you turn your camera horizontal, maybe, Matt, by chance? And it looks like you have an, uh, an art night going there. You got... Uh... that better? Perfect. Awesome, yeah. Me and Miles, Haysmith, and I are both, kind of, we're both part of the group and just hanging out thing. Trying to awesome. Hey, Miles, I talked to you on the uh, app, I think. Yeah, earlier today. Awesome. Yeah. You wanna, did you give us your contact info? You want people know how to find you? Uh, yeah, so by mine's uh, Matt Jackson Tattoos, um, and then we're in Columbus, Indiana. Cool. And uh, mine's It's Me Bone Z on Instagram. Cool. And then uh, uh, Melissa, you want to, uh, I don't know what your audio is like in the background, but. I don't think my audio is too bad right now. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. I'm Melissa. Uh, you can find me at uh, on Instagram, M-A-C underscore M-I-S-S-A. I'm out of Oregon. Um, this is awesome. I'm having a lot of fun. I'm doing an Oregon scenery. Um, so I'm a little bit different on the color palette, but I'm having fun. Awesome. And Sandy, you're up. Hello, hey. it's Sandy, and I've got my partner here who's joining me, making his <laughs> first painting ever. Make yeah. Shout out. <laughs> and, awesome. Uh, I'm starting mine, and uh, you can find me at uh, on Instagram at Sandy McCandy, and or on the app under the same name. I'm going to uh, spotlight Nick again. And, uh, oh, wow. Zoom through the chat room, see if anybody's got any uh, comments or questions. You want to tell us a holiday story, Nick? A holiday story? <laughs> uh, shit. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a holiday person. I, I I think I think it's a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> bah humbug. I like the contrast. I am also uh, 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 I I would like to consider myself a general, but I'm probably way less on the war on Christmas. If I had more time, I could try to be a general on the war on Christmas. But uh, I also lose in my house. Got to. It's very festive here. <laughs> I try to get out of as much holiday stuff as I possibly can. Basically, I'm a lot of fun to be around, so. <laughs> Do 
you have any favorite places where you've done? I mean, it's kind of a silly question. How about, uh, what are some of the fun places that you've done landscape uh, paintings at? Tell us about your travels. I think my number one right now is Machu Picchu in Peru. I had a chance to stand on Machu Picchu and paint the mountain range there. Oh, wow. Um, got tore the hell up by, stand, by these biting sand flies too. That was crazy. Um, but that was an epic experience all around. Sounds pretty amazing. Actually, uh, reminds me of a question that came in earlier about uh, tips on plain air painting. So I imagine that did you have you must, did you have, you had to hike to Machu Picchu, right? Everyone hikes there. Um, we took transportation. Okay. You don't have to hike in. There is a very popular like five day hike or ten day hike or something that you can do, but I mean, we didn't do any of that. We just took uh, took the bus up to the mountain, drops you off. I convinced them to let me bring my painting stuff in because they're really strict on, you know, they don't want people like vandalizing or whatever, but. Um, yeah, I just found a quiet little spot kind of kind of on the edge of the mountain there and just kind of painted, painted all day. That was pretty amazing. My next Bucket list is to go to the pyramids in Giza. Mm. Paint plain air of like the, the, the Great Pyramids or something, or maybe the Sphinx or something. That I think that'd be amazing. Uh, a month, a couple months ago, Damon Conklin did a trip over to uh, Turkey, I believe. And, uh, oh, really? Right in between lockdowns. And uh, some of the pictures that he sent back of those ancient ruins were just out of control. Yeah, definitely wouldn't mind going there. That's that's super cool. He did, he did that, man. Oh. Not for the faint of heart. No, he was amazing. <laughs> uh, Jake from the Fireside Tattoo Network, uh, how about those Memphis chiggers, Nick? Oh, yeah. Yep, Jake. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was painting... I was painting down in Memphis with Jake and a bunch of people and um, apparently just stood right in the middle of like the biggest chigger colony in the history of chiggers because my entire lower half of my body was torn up for a month. Just red itchy welts from, from waist down. Elliot Coogie says, good morning from Louisiana. Although it's not morning in Louisiana. It's the same time as it is here. Hmm. Yeah, maybe it's a very late night. go to a split view here for a little bit so uh, everyone can see what's going on. We need Tattoo Grandpa back to tell his stories. Uh, it is pretty amazing. I get to hear them all and, and all of their variants and uh, I'm yet to <laughs> uh, get to tire of them. It's pretty fun. It's like a fractal of, uh, you know, ideas and stories. Has anybody taken any of uh, Nick's seminars that's uh, on the call here? I intend to, though. Uh, they're out of control. The holistic uh, tattooing and the holistic painting uh, classes with these. Out of control. I love them.
when, oh shit, I was just going to be like, usually my, uh, one of my go-to questions is like, so Nick, when was the, what was your first experiences with, uh, with Guy? Uh, maybe now's a good time to talk about it while he's not here. Hmm. My first experience with Guy. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I got tattooed by Guy and Paul Booth at the same time, at the very first ever Massachusetts convention. That was not fun. Uh, I remember. Uh, I remember watching that. I didn't know who you were at the time. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I had no idea who you were at the time. I knew you were the dreaded kid that was getting his uh, the collab. It was amazing, but. Uh, I hadn't met you at Dark Side before then. Come on now, no, come on. That was after Dark Side, wasn't it? It was during Dark Side. Um, ah, uh, were you working? Or, no, at Dark maybe Side that was just then? before. I remember uh, was it was. Uh, I remember one of the. I remember getting yelled at by Joe Cap at one of those. Me and me and Sean. Um, it was either the first one or the second one, but. Uh, that was crazy. It took forever to finish, eh? But you did finish it. You finally got out to guys, and. It it is never, it it was never finished. I'm like, the worst tattoo client. You ever do a, you, you've done a collab with Guy, right? Yeah, we tattooed uh, Carson Hill. We, we did a sleeve on Carson Hill. That's fun. I uh, love the fact that he's uh, been thinking on those new machines and seems like he's getting some traction again. Yeah, they're really nice. I've, I've been using it. It's good. Yeah, sweet. So let's see. So T. Von Krieger is asking, um, what is it that made you move towards a medical base in your paintings? Say that again. Uh, what is it that made you move towards a medical base in your paintings? Medical base. Maybe uh, the, the themes. There's a lot of medical themes. Um, He'll let us know. I don't really know, man. It's just things I'm fascinated by, I guess. Strange, strange compulsion and fascination. How, uh, how much do you think you're, you're, I'm trying to figure out, I, I, you know, trying to figure out the appropriate way to describe it, but like the fact that you have opinions, right? Or you, you've always said something to say, like even from the very beginning, it seemed, um, you know, you had a, a story or a theme or, you know, everything, you know, you're, you're always telling stories inside of your art, it seems, although maybe landscapes, I don't know if, if they're different or, or if it's just a different type of story, but um, I don't know, I guess, so the question would be like, right from the get-go, it seemed like um, you always had powerful, strong, opinionated uh, themes to your work and how, how much do you attribute your success to that or do you think it hindered you at all or? I mean, I, honestly, it probably hindered me, and I mean, it's not really good from a marketing perspective, I think. I don't know. Probably just want to paint, like, stuff that people want to look at, right, and, like, don't need to think about, because that's our culture, but hmm. it's kind of why I also like landscape painting, because it's free of opinions. It's just beauty and that anyone can relate to. But yeah, I mean, those, the, you know, the, the side of my art that's expressing an opinion on society or culture or the human condition, I mean, none of that is designed to be popular or something people want to look at or want to hear, but it's like something that I need to express, I guess, it's my truth.
Yeah, yeah. So I guess um, it's funny because I was thinking of your tattoos. I was just imagining, I was just remembering you, you know, coming into Dark Side in those wicked early days. So, was, you know, it seems like it's one of those things that helped, you know, maybe helped with your tattoo career, but, you know, limits the, you know, accessibility of your paintings or? Yeah, I would say that's probably pretty accurate. I mean, yeah, it's not for like mass pop culture consumption, but in the tattoo world, I mean, that's what's one, you know, one of the many beautiful things about tattooing is it's a very accepting community of misfits and rebels, you know, and who appreciate people who have something to say or who have a unique take on something and they don't mind seeing things that are intense or unpleasant or um, against the status quo, I guess. So I feel like I, that's probably why I fit right in as a tattooer after I started tattooing. It's a very, very awesome, accepting community. I'm very thankful for. Um, but then, yeah, as far as marketing some intense, you know, weird political statement or cultural statement art towards the masses, I mean, that's just an uphill climb, that's for sure, you know. So, uh, were there some of those uh, artists from back in the dark side days you still uh, catch up with at all? or? Yeah, I was just just uh, talking to Nick Trammell not not too recently. Nice. I mean, I follow people on social media, but I, I haven't been back to Connecticut in years. I really kind of have have no use for it, unfortunately. <laughs> I, I I still have some family in Connecticut, and obviously some friends. So friends and family, friends and family aside, I really just don't miss. Connecticut at all so I don't I don't get up there much good evening uh, Susanna hey I thought I'd hop on for a second and say hello awesome nice catching up yeah I was gonna say the question I had earlier was just like a lot of tattoo artists that I talk to are always like I would rather not paint anything I tattoo so that it's kind of like my own thing versus work. Like I do a lot of flowers and I also paint flowers, but some people just really like to keep it completely separate. So it doesn't feel like the same job all day. Yeah. I've had, I've had some of that, like it, it can get very tedious and repetitive to tattoo the way that I paint. Cause I paint in a very tedious style I guess well I noticed that you're not wearing gloves today which I haven't seen you paint in a few years now but last time I saw you painting you're wearing like latex gloves yeah uh, I don't know I man I haven't worn gloves in so so many years so maybe that was a long time ago that you saw me paint it was a really it was a really really long time ago <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah, I think I used to be more and more paranoid about solvents and um but really I have gotten very good at controlling what I do and I, I you know I really don't come in direct contact with any solvents. So like I said you seem to be just super precise about everything and like do you like to to needle needle the tiny details? Is that like your favorite thing to do? Yeah, I think there's something soothing in that for me. Um, yeah, it's very like meditative and yeah, it's a very, I guess, soothing headspace. But, um, you know, my struggle is to not not do so, so much noodling when it's not called for. It, I think it's really hard to loosen up for a lot of artists. Because you have yeah, to and like... I think you know, I think there's artists who it's, it's, it, who could stand to tighten up too. It oh, depends for sure. <laughs> which, which extreme you're on. I was painting at Hell City and Guy Aitchison called my work. Uh, I can't remember, but it was like, uh, I don't know, in, intensely detailed or something like that. And I was like, well, good. But I don't, I don't know how to make ever, anything loose because my brain always wants to make everything tight and overly detailed. Yeah. And if I don't, it just feels like it's not enough work. Hmm. 
Yep. Does that make sense? <laughs> yep, that's a relatable statement for sure. I definitely feel you, Susanna. Yeah, I like I want really bleeding fingers. <laughs> I struggle with it every day. <laughs> Do the exercise with the isolating the details, something I'm focusing on now, so I'm not doing that. It's so hard. I'm finding tonight uh, I'm using paintbrushes that are all like splayed. None of them are actually nice and uh, tight right now. So it's kind of forcing me into just being a little looser. Oh yeah, somebody had told me just like use giant paintbrushes. Like take whatever paintbrush you prefer to use almost all the time and just use one that's like four times bigger. Yeah, that's very good advice. I, I totally back that. Um, I mean, right now I'm using the biggest brush that I feel comfortable using for this painting. I haven't, this is the only brush I've used so far. So um, that'll, that'll keep you focusing on your large shapes and values better. So you don't get sucked into the, the details too soon. Who all so is in the call? I can't see. Uh, you swipe to the left or to the right. Uh, you control what you see. Um, Zin, have you ever uh, checked out the Illustrator's Master's class? Um, no, I haven't. I probably should. Um, I just started getting back to painting like recently because it's been difficult. Yeah, it's a, I, you, I think you dig it. It's a, a lot of serious illustrators. I know that Leo's got some uh, experience with it. Inside of I haven't, I haven't done the IMC yet. No? Uh, oh, shit. You've learned from a lot of those teachers, though. I tend, I tend to a LuxCon and, and uh, have learned a lot from those guys through that show. Um, and then I'm doing a mentorship with Donato Giancola during, uh, via the Smart School uh, this, uh, this March. But I've been wanting to do the IMC. It looks amazing. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised because, well, like I said, I'm, uh, I, I see you t talking about a lot of the same teachers. Nick, you, Nick, you've never uh, gotten there either yet, have you? No, I haven't. Yeah. It's uh, it's fun. We did a, a drunk critique with the uh, the illust with uh, uh, Dan Dos Santos and uh, a, a bunch of the IMC. Uh, uh, it was amazing. The uh, uh, the different. Uh, kind of different vibe i mean they're just they're about story and priority and you know why why are they in that position and you know not another position or you know they don't really seem that scared it was it was pretty amazing the uh to uh to go through it it's uh anyways illustrators master's class is awesome <laughs> or smarter school that's the uh, the online version yeah how do i um how do i access that is it through um I think it's just smartschool.com or imc.com, I believe. I'm making notes. I'm like an old lady with all this stuff. Smart school. Nick, you've traveled to uh, take some some master classes. You want to maybe chat about some of those uh, experiences? Sure, I've uh, taken some amazing courses and workshops at uh, Grand Central Atelier in Queens, New York City. Um, they're a classical atelier, um, so they teach a very specific discipline of drawing and painting that stems from the European masters. So it's representational realism. Um, you know, nothing abstract or conceptual or modern art. It's, it's the stuff you see in like museums basically. And uh, I've taken some landscapes, some still life and had some great mentorship here and there from other artists so, along the way. Did a few semesters of art college at Pear College of Art in Connecticut, uh, went straight out of high school. 
but dropped out of art college when I got my tattoo apprenticeship. So I don't have a degree or a BFA or anything. I, I never finished art college, but that's where I first learned to oil paint. In, my, in the few semesters of art college I did do, I learned how to oil paint, learned the basics anyway of what I'm doing now and I've just pursued it ever since on my own. All right, guys, I'm going to hop off. I have to put my kiddo to bed. I just wanted to hop on and say hello. Awesome. Thanks for hopping Thanks on. Thanks for uh, popping in. You guys have fun. It looks really good. The uh, next uh, next Sunday, 9 o'clock, it's a bio, bio event. And then uh, pretty much every Sunday we're doing uh, some art jam. So feel free to, uh, to join anytime. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Well, thanks, guys. Cheers. Thank you. Good bye. Night. Had a couple of people talking about doing an art retreat on the uh, uh, one of the social medias. It's uh, really tough not being able to really plan any events or travel. Yeah. Yeah, the Paradise Art Retreats are some of my favorite memories, so I miss those and uh, definitely appreciate you being the catalyst for making those happen. Well, that was actually, I think Michelle was the catalyst. I was, okay. the, unwill I was the unwilling uh, producer, co-producer. Oh, okay. Yeah, but uh, after the second tattoo gathering, I was... I, I suppose I, I took it a little too seriously and uh, uh, definitely was not in a position to like keep doing tattoo conventions. And then, uh, but Michelle was very much uh, enjoying the, the Jiminy Peak and the vibe and um, was like, what you know, and I think it was coming off of Interstate and uh, she was like, well, you know, what if we come back here and just, you know, paint? Um, and it was hard to argue with that. It was definitely hard to argue when, you know, uh, you know, Michelle and Guy are like, we'd like to come back here if you do another event. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, it was definitely very much like, I, I, d I definitely don't want to, like, you know, stress my family or myself to the point where we're breaking. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, so then they, they were, uh, they put the energy in to, to make sure that it happened. And uh, I definitely, you know, taken on the producer role since then but I was uh, I was like I said I wouldn't consider myself the catalyst of that event I was the uh, I was along for the ride <laughs> mm. super stoked that you guys brought that to Albuquerque yeah that was amazing yeah I mean uh, about a month before the uh, art retreat I, I you know came to my senses and I was like holy shit this is gonna be you know pretty unbelievable and you know, the energy and the vibe is, you know, it's very similar to the, ta you know, the Paradise Tattoo Gathering, except for like, you know, no one's, you know, torturing other human beings, you know, and, you know, the well. stress, le stress level's a little, uh, you know, hey, you want to go have a tasty beverage? Oh, yeah, sure. But, you know, and then it's, it's a lot less, uh, well, I mean, the focus is on the art as opposed to the clients. Yeah. And, um, you know, obviously with a tattoo convention, it should be on the clients because it's who's getting tattooed and... But yeah, the art retreats, I, I, and I, again, you know, because, you know, you're coming out and everyone comes out, you know, makes that energy. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot easier to kind of put together than it is to, uh, you know, create all this shit. <laughs> Very excited to do another one someday, though, and get everybody back together. And, uh... Yeah. And New Mexico is out of control. Yes. <laughs> It's funny because, Tommy, you know, I was born here and uh, it doesn't, it's sometimes, you know, you really don't see the magic till 
until other people point it out and you kind of, oh yeah, I guess so, huh? Yes, that is a very true statement. Um, yeah, I've had that happen so many times for me where you just get used to things and you start taking them a little bit for granted or it just becomes uh, mundane. Last year I was in Scotland with my wife and at this pub, we, some guy came up to me and started asking, oh, where are you from? And I told him, New Mexico. And he was like, oh man. And I said, yeah, but what you guys got out here is just pure magic. It's, you know, and he said, well, I beg to differ. I'll trade you because I've been in New Mexico and the, the, that place is pure magic. And I'm like, oh, and I, after a while I thought about it and it's like, yeah, I guess you're right. I'm just so used to it that it's, it's exciting when you, when you find magic somewhere else. It's nice to, it's nice to reaffirm it and, and re reestablish the magic of where you're at, you know? Yeah. I mean, the human brain's designed to like, you know, you know, rep repetition, you know, and the brain is, de is designed to be considered safe and, you know, you're almost designed to overlook it. And uh, it's one of the things I found, you know, just doing this, you know, working with people, it's like, it's, it is fucking magic, like every single day. And uh, even though, you know, it, it, it kind of becomes, I mean, the same thing with tattooing, right? You know, it's like, it's magic every day, but it is a, a job that you do every day. But, you know, you, you can tell who all of a sudden doesn't find it magic every day. And, uh, yeah. So we have uh, Tivan has joined us. Hey, what's going on, everyone? What's up? Hey. Hey, Tivan. I'm just, just kind of getting started. No problems. Uh, Jessica Keel says, hello, thanks for the live. Uh, that's on uh, the Hyperspace Studios Facebook that we're streaming out on. Oh, okay, looks like i uh, got some questions here. Atomic Injections 47. Uh, Nick, when you're hitting those undercloud highlights, what's the best way to keep your hard edge from blending? Um, well, yeah. clouds are tough because they do have some hard edges, but but they have a lot of soft edges as well. So um, what, I, what you've seen me do so far, if, if that person's been watching, um, I just laid all the paint on there in, you know, chunks of color. Um, now I'm taking a fan brush, like a blending brush, and I'm softening it all out and making it all soft. And then I'll go back again if I need to find any edges again. I'll just go back again with a with another flat brush or like a round brush um, and reassert those edges. So it's a multi-step process and you can kind of push and pull it back and forth, make it softer, then make it sharper again. And uh, another question is, is everyone using oils or maybe? Yeah, I am. Yeah, I am as well. Yeah, I'm using oil.
Put your laser in. Uh... Won't you get some laser in done at one point? Nick? On your arm? Yep. Sure was. <laughs> <laughs> what was? <laughs> About 10 years ago. Haven't, haven't gotten any since. Oh, shit. Mike, can you see my horrible tattoos on, on screen? Yeah, yeah. I mean, classic tattoos. Okay, classic's a better word, but the other horrible. <laughs> no offense to the artist that did him. He's a very, very nice man and actually a good tattooer, but I'm just, I've outgrown these, these tattoos and, uh, you know, they were 18-year-old decisions. But I've basically given up on myself, so I don't know if I'll ever finish the job. Well, that's silly. Maybe not. Much, no, much more silly. fun to, to give tattoos, I guess. I am sure of that. Kind of difficult to describe the mentality of just like the tattoo becomes a part of you and you just like look in the mirror and don't even see it anymore and just like my brain's full of other things and more more pressing matters <laughs> you know like yeah. just like I don't even remember I have all these horrible tattoos till someone points them out and I'm like oh yeah thanks sorry <laughs> <laughs> I think when I was like a teenager and younger 20s, I was just on a mission to not fit into this like bullshit society. So just get covered, you know, and now I just look past my own appearance. I don't really care about it all that much. But now I'm stuck with all these old, old decisions. Uh, even Qualls says, what's good, players? <laughs> I don't even know how to respond to that, but thanks. <laughs> have a good chuckle. Uh, Seth Blood is asking if it's too late to join the Zoom. <laughs> I hate using this Facebook because I'm always so inadequate at it, but looks awesome, Leo, and I hope you enjoyed Scotland, says Billy from Scotland, who's actually still on here. Thanks for... Uh, oh, awesome. I'll trade, I'll trade you. <laughs> Just for a minute. Scotland is pretty badass. Nick, have you ever been to Scotland? Wait. Oh, no. Scotland, no. I haven't. We were in Ireland. Yeah, I've been through Ireland, England, Wales. I have not made it to Scotland, unfortunately. Well, you got to get up to Edinburgh. I think uh, Tom Strom's up there uh, with Jack. Yeah. Uh, it's sick. No, my name is Scottish. It's like a haunted city, man. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it, I guess... Uh, Hitler was going to retire there, so there was a couple, very few places that he didn't, you know, bomb the hell out of, and uh, Edinburgh was one, and you, you could tell, like, uh, you, you know, you, when I work, go through Europe, all I notice is how old everything is, uh, but then when you're in Edinburgh, it's like, holy shit, like, everything's old, like, mm. you, you know, it's, it's noticeable how much, when you go back to the rest of it, it's how much, you know, is, yeah. is new. You know, when you go to like the old sections, just anyways, Edinburgh is fucking out of control. Fucking and also tour, tour underneath Edinburgh, the old streets that they built up on top of. Yeah, the closes, is that what they're called? Yeah, like, yeah, like Mary Queen's Close and all that. Yeah. Mary Queen's Close. Ireland, too, though, was absolutely insane. I could, I could stay there forever. Yeah, we 
a pretty good time, Nick. You did a uh, seminar, uh, was it in Dublin? Yes. Can other artists join you as well? Yes. Okay, so Oliver Lonian says, can other artists join? Uh, yes. You know, the, the best thing to do is to... Oh, shit. Uh, go to the uh, uh, Reinventing the Tattoo mobile app. And uh, in the events, you'll find the, the links and such. It's getting kind of late to join now, but... Uh, yeah, if you can figure out where... You know, get the link and let's do it. Uh, Dennis, oh shit, Dennis Wheeler says, we, Nick Baxter, my favorite artist for many years. I think that's, uh, <laughs> I think that's Dennis, 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 Dennis. Yeah, hey Dennis, how goes it? I remember Dennis came over to do a guest spot years ago. It was fun. He's a great guy. Great artist. Guys, I enjoyed painting with you. I'm going to cut out. Awesome. Right, thanks, well, thanks man. again. Take care. Take it easy. And... Like to get nervous when you teach seminars? I do get nervous, yeah. Do you think it's uh, worth over uh, overcoming the horrendous fear? Or, uh... Oh, absolutely. It's one of the most rewarding things I've done in my life, for sure. It's teaching and helping others, of course, it feels good to do that. And if you have a genuine love for the thing you're teaching as well, so... Absolutely worth overcoming fear of public speaking and fear of, I don't know, being on display, I guess. But yeah, it's awesome. Do you have any, uh, any stories or uh, any times you could talk about getting through it for, uh, for people? Or... Oh, man. I, I mean, meditation is great if you have a meditation practice, some sort of mindfulness, breathing practice, and, and any kind of... Eastern tradition meditation is amazing, but just for centering yourself, calming your thoughts, getting your mind focused. But I mean, besides that, it's just a lot of lost sleep the night before, um, mm -hmm. a lot of panicked bathroom trips. So, you know, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> Hey Gabe, remember that time we played a we played a practical joke on you? Oh, I completely do. Yes, at uh, the art retreat. Yeah, yeah, made you think I wasn't going to show up for my for my seminar. Had you sweating bullets, and then you, I was I think really you, just you like said... hiding in the bathroom the whole time. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, Brian. Uh... Uh, yeah, that was that was great. That was fun. That was fun. So, what was that? Was that April Fool's, or was that for, like for your birthday? So it was probably for April Fools because uh, I think because I was out in New Mexico, so that would have been a springtime. Show. Although I'm, I don't think it was April Fools, but yeah. <laughs> well, there was something where he needed to play a joke on you, and I was like, I, I, I was all for it. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah. That's exactly what event producers love. Is uh... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is there is there presenters hiding in the bathroom? <laughs> And the, and, the, and the producer, Brian, he was like, you know, I don't know. I seem sick. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but like speaking of your nervousness question or whatever, I mean, that just made it even worse. Wait, what did do during the practical joke and hiding out first? Or? 
Yeah, being nervous of public speaking and having to go in front of a crowd and then having to also like turn into a joke where I'm hiding in the bathroom and like, <laughs> making people think I'm like, you know, being careless and just, you know, missing my event time. Where the fuck is Nick? I was probably running around trying to find you. I'm sure I was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Brian. Yep, I remember your panic text messages too, just like sitting in the bathroom stall, just like watching you blow up my phone. <laughs> uh, yeah. although the for me just personally the best practical joke was uh kim took a pregnancy test or had a friend who was pregnant take a pregnancy test before she was pregnant so that was my april fool's joke i took a pregnancy test it's here look <laughs> oh no oh yeah <laughs> thought you were having another one huh i didn't do a no that was before cecilia i didn't that was oh uh, that was the first thought that i could have possibly had a kid yeah. i think she I was just testing do. you prep work well i don't do uh practical jokes now anymore <laughs> I remember telling Sean from Dark Side Tattoo that uh, Lucasfilm was suing him, so he had to change his name. <laughs> that was fun. As a practical joke? Yeah. Hey, How April far did you take joke. it? Oh, I, I went probably like five, ten minutes. Like, we got to get the lawyers out. I mean, I don't know. Do you think you're going to get a lawyer that's going to be able to fight Lucasfilm? <laughs> 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 And that's what the, the, the name Dark Side is taken from? I don't know. Or inspired by? Maybe. maybe. Yeah. No, uh, do you do, guys do uh, Art Nights at Art Realm? Or Art Realm's the uh, studio, right? Yeah. Um, not, not since the pandemic, unfortunately, but um, past few years before that, yeah, we, we had occasional Art Nights at the studio. And you, you, you just moved into a new space a couple months ago. You want to talk about that a little bit? Or? Yeah, in June, we uh, moved our location to a nicer spot and it has like separated tattoo rooms um so everyone has their own like separate private space which is better for the whole like social distancing times we're in now and uh it's been really really helpful because we were we kind of had the pit style before where everyone's just in one big open room and closer to each other but um, although that is fun sometimes for the banter and the sense of community, it's, I don't know, I've, I've always liked having my own kind of more secluded space to work. And then of course, with all like the COVID stuff and wanting to keep people like further away and in their own separate spaces, it's just works better with the way we have it now. So it, it's been really cool. Nice. I, uh, I saw the video, did you guys must have some sort of drone action going on. It looked pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, my co-owner, Andrew, um, is into drones and that kind of technology. He has this amazing photography drone. So, comes in handy. Huh. Billy from... Uh... Scotland says public speaking the best known laxative to man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that is the truth, Billy.
great way to shit your pants as an adult. <clears throat> to your point, though, it really is amazing to be able to, like, you know, organize, you know, what is working in a manner that is, you know, pass offable to other people. The, and the effect that it has on, you know, on your own work, right? Because when you're, when you're making a, a list or a, a thought or a, a concept for that you're passing to other people, then the next time you're doing it, uh, you know, you You'll, you know, you can't compromise anything, right? So, you know, you're, you're like, if I'm teaching this to other people, I really have to, like, practice what I preach kind of a thing. Yeah, well, yeah there's that and the process of having to organize your thoughts in order to present them to other people in the first place helps you take stock of what you're doing and um, learn your own process in greater detail, too. Pretty insane. I remember those worldwide conferences were definitely uh, pretty nuts for, for getting that all together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that very first one in Rome was amazing. That was that was such a good time. Very fun. That trip, the road trip with Alex, was pretty fun too. Woohoo! Full Italian experience. <laughs> yep, that was awesome. Very fond memories. Those that was super cool. Well, and the, and just the crowd, I think, had never seen anything like that before in our in, in our in- industry, to my knowledge, anyways. And the crowd was just so receptive. Yeah, you know, it, it feels like. Uh, yeah, I mean, I hadn't heard or seen anything like it before. That's you know, yeah, it was. Uh, it was it was a hell of a lot of fun. I remember seeing Boris's tattoos massive and listening to him. I was, that was a highlight, one of the highlights. Was he at that first one in Rome or uh, only the later ones? I think it was, was it Rome? I thought it was. Uh... Hey everyone, I'm back. Hey, how's it going? Hey. Howdy. So, Nick, where are you at? Looks like you've got the whole board covered. Yeah, I've refined the, the, the sky and the clouds. I've got those pretty much done. I'm not really going to touch the sky or the clouds for the rest of the painting. So I'm just getting into the detail pass of, of, of everything now. So I, I can just kind of detail out the mid-ground and the foreground to my heart's content at this point. Take it as far as, as far as I want to. Is the sky a, just a very soft, not very detailed kind of area, or is it because you've, you've put a lot of time into it and gotten all that detail dialed in? No, it's just, uh, I mean, clouds. So I just chunked on the paint, and then I took my, my fan blending brush, this, this guy right okay. here, yep. and just hit it like this, hit it like this, hit it like this, back, and then... <laughs> went in again and just kind of hit hit these cloud details a little bit softened them again and then boom you're done with your you know with, with your sky it's pretty pretty easy i guess <clears throat> that's funny I've, I've never really used one of these fan brushes but I've, I've got one just sitting on my easel to say use me so i'm going to try that tonight i'm going to try to feather out my clouds a little bit with this thing Cool. We have uh, another person beaming in, uh, Oliver, um, I think from Europe. If you could, uh, I don't know if you could hear me, but if you could get your camera horizontal, that would be cool. And uh, yeah, Jeff, or sorry, uh, Nick, just to fact check, that first Worldwide Conference Rome, that was the one that, uh, Bor- Bor- it was uh, Alex de Passe, Jeff, Boris, uh, you and I. And uh, that was the only time I think I've seen Boris do his seminar. And uh, yeah, just seeing it for me, seeing his tattoos like on that massive screen, just I mean, he's always blown me away, but it was like, holy cup of Jesus. Yeah. And Gogoy was there. Did you, did you mention Gogoy? 
Yeah, yeah, here actually I'm going to start my video. I've got the, uh, I don't know if you could see the, I got fo the folder. Oh, I lost it. Anyways. Yes. <laughs> so Oliver, where are, where are you beaming in from? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, we could hear you. The closer you get to your microphone, the better we could hear you. Thanks for letting me in. I was sleeping already. Huh. It's uh, four in the morning here. And, and where is here? In Europe, in the three of Germany. Ah, Germany, nice. Yeah, you we're uh, from the States. Huh? We're doing a, a, a biomech party uh, next week, which we're doing a little bit earlier in the evening so that uh, Europeans can be part of it a little bit easier. I think we're starting, you know, it'll, it'll be like midnight your time, but that's, that's a little bit better. Would be great. Nice. And how can I see it? How can um, I, can I uh, do I know? Um, it'll be in this, on the same channel. But uh, yeah, if you uh, if you install the reinventing the tattoo app, which is free, you can get it at the app store. Uh, just look up reinventing the tattoo. Uh, you'll see the schedule of all the different things we have going on, and you can turn on notifications, and it'll let you know, uh, you know, if you have a supply list that uh, that you need to see or anything like that. So that's the best way if you want to know about all these different things that we're doing. Get the app. Okay, thank you. Nice. I read a book uh, some years ago. I think 15 years ago. Nice. Well, the app is free, although uh, the, the book is available through the app in an electronic form, and we're adding a bunch of stuff over the next uh, few weeks, although there's already a lot of new stuff that wasn't in there in the, in the book. We've got some stuff from Nick and... Uh, Russ Abbott and a number of other artists, Phil Garcia, Steve Butcher, Megan Jean Morris. Cool. Felt very good. I like the idea. It's a good thing in the Corona time to join some community stuff. Yeah, you know what? We're trying to do stuff like this many times a week if we can. Like today, uh, there was a drawing group earlier in the day. Like if you'd had the app, it would have sent you a notification. And that was at uh, noon Eastern time, which had been like six o'clock for you. And uh, that was a good one. I was involved in that one for, for part of it. And then tomorrow we've got another one for the reinventing subscribers, which, uh, well, that's, that's a little bit later. That's 9 p.m. Uh, Eastern. So that would be back to three in the morning for you. Okay, yeah, but it's good. It's good. If I know it, I can stay up. It's cool. Thank you very much. I will join it next time. Nice. And there's also the uh, 9 a.m. one uh, tomorrow. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Tomorrow morning, we got one at 9 a.m. Uh, with Jake Meeks. And his drawing groups are always great. And so, yeah, that's, that's what, three in the afternoon in Germany. Uh, is it also free or do I have to cost it money? Or how the only you... ones that are not free are the uh, the Monday night ones. Usually are just for the the paid subscribers of the reinventing content. But okay. uh, all of the all the other stuff, the Sunday night paint groups, these are for the general public. We're trying to have oh, as much stuff as possible. That's like you know things people can participate in. Not just watch, but actually be part of. Okay, and is it okay if I ask another friend from Germany? He's very good in in biomechanic stuff. Yeah, yeah. I bring as many friends as you can. I mean, we're we're uh, looking to spread the word. I mean, we're trying to provide something, especially for the the places that are shut down right now, and. Uh, have a place where people can meet and do activities together and uh, chat and just, you know, try to get some sense of, of community that you might get at a convention, except we can't go to conventions right now. Okay. Thank you for the information. Okay. Thanks for showing up. Thank you very much.
And then we also have uh, Seth Blood has joined us. Hey, Seth, where are you coming hey. from? Hey. Uh, Texas. Right East on. Texas. I, I meant to start this earlier with y'all, but I, I guess I misunderstood the time. Oh, yeah. You know what? The time zone thing, it screws people up all the time, including me. And, uh, you know, I mean, like just the other day, we had this thing with Russ Abbott, and I was looking forward to it all day. And, you know, the time arrived, and I'm just sitting there happily tattooing. Oh, I got another hour. But, uh, <laughs> so I had to actually start the thing while I was still tattooing. But at least our audience are all tattoo artists, and they get it. You know, it wasn't like embarrassing yeah. or anything. Just slightly clunky. Yeah, you know, we do this yeah. so much that it'll be one minute before showtime, and I'm like, ah, oh, guy will show up. Hmm. I think. I, I hope. <laughs> Wait yeah, a minute. I mean, only only one time out of ten uh, that right. it was with it was with Russ. It was a uh, was that was fun. I was like, oh Russ, here you go. I'll I'll be back. <laughs> Well, I'm still used to these things happening at nine Eastern. At you know, I guess I was just a little off uh, off yeah. guard there. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, near impossible to get it perfectly right when you're dealing with global, uh, you know, time zones. You know, it, that was one of the biggest things that I realized going from real world events to online events is, uh, yeah, everyone's in, literally in different time zones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was it. My mistake. I was thinking nine o'clock our time. Well, you made it. Yeah, I appreciate it. We're still going strong. And actually was was away for 45 minutes myself. Uh, but we've got a good group here, a lot of regulars who've been uh, coming to these uh, drawing and painting groups for uh, for a few months now, as long as we've been doing them. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a nice, steadily growing group. It's gotten to a point where uh, we've had to start having additional paint and drawing groups just to have room for everybody because it just seems like this is, this is a great way to sort of make up for, for our lost community. Yeah, being able to paint with other people makes it easier to want to do it. <laughs> yeah actually this is true it's true i mean we shouldn't have to be in a group to to want to pick up a paintbrush but there is something motivating about uh these kinds of things i think so uh billy our Tattooer friend from Scotland says, I've been tattooing almost 15 years and never painted anything as yet. This has been oh. very inspiring and making me want to break out my paints and start learning. Well, Billy, just pay attention to our schedule. We do this kind of thing at least twice a month, but I'm sure it'll be more than that in the near future. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, there's no way you can't learn if... Uh, you pay attention to even just a little bit of what's being said. And of course, uh, you know, you're able to ask questions, you know, and the, the kind of things that you're just not sure you know, how to, how to navigate around. You've got access to not just uh, people like Nick and I, but the other people in the, in the group here, there's a, there's a lot of uh, experience in the room. And back to featuring Nick. I'm going to uh, beam in on my phone and effectively take a 10 minute break from driving. Okay. Well, we'll catch you in a little bit. Sweet. Well, I'll, I'll still be monitoring. Um, I'll be back monitoring in like two minutes. Yeah. Okay. So, who else have we got in the room? Uh, anyone else uh, show up while I was away? Yeah, Tivon, I'm here. Oh, nice. Everyone's yeah. being so quiet. Tivon, what are you working on? Uh, <clears throat> it is more or less just like a, a cloud landscape. Nice. A little bit of a little bit of a I don't know, some buildings underneath. So yeah, I guess uh 
at some point after Gabe gets back, we can uh, take a short break to just do a quick share of everybody's, everyone's projects. And uh, oh. then uh, I would love to also get a close up look at uh, what Nick is doing and maybe he can explain a little bit about where he's at with his technique here. Yeah, right, right now I'm just in the noodle phase. It's just about, you know, I have all my basic values, colors, and shapes blocked in. So now I can just refine them as needed with smaller brushes. I'm, I'm using a, uh, a number two round right now just to fill in little, little trees and cliffs on this piece of land here. But still haven't touched the lower portion of, of the beach and everything. That, that's going to be a little challenging. How so? Uh, managing what that? Managing color and value. Um, it, 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 it needs to appear dark, but the but the water is kind of like deceptively light. I don't know. It's kind of hard to explain. There's a lot going on. Yeah, yeah. I, I see what you mean. There's an area where the water is uh, kind of darkened by the reflection of that rock mass. Yeah, and uh, it's and, not going to uh, like that, but it's uh, sure. it's the kind of thing that would probably be, be a lot easier if you weren't doing it all a prima, and you could it. let it dry and you know come back and do a glaze over it and you know, just kind of darken the whole thing a little bit. Yeah, yeah, and like the you know the water is definitely not finished at all. You know that's pretty rough at the moment, but. This further landmass and, and the sky is all done. And this closer landmass is getting close to being done. <clears throat> and this this triangular piece of foreground grass in the corner is, just needs a few little blades of grass, a few little scratchy highlights, and that'll be done. So it's really just about the water and the beach, which is probably the hardest part of this whole thing for me. Well, you know, it sounds like you've kind of clearly identified what your problems are going to be ahead of time. And, and uh, of course, <laughs> part of that comes with experience. But, you know, this, this goes back to something that, uh, you know, I've been trying to encourage with myself with, with the projects that, that I do is to figure out what my goals are. You know, and, and they, they can be little goals. Like, for example, I want to make sure in this one that I have a nice sense of descending contrast in the, the different rock masses so that, uh, you know, each one exists in the right place on the value scale so that they appear to drop off into the distance in a convincing way. So that's one of my goals is to do that. Um, there's a certain feeling also that's a little bit harder to describe with the, the brush work and the finish that I want to have on this. Um, I know what it is. It's a hard thing to say out loud in words, but uh, that's another thing that's sort of a concrete goal. So, you know, I, I don't know if, if you ever do that is, uh, you know, kind of have things that you're specifically working on with, with each piece uh, where you actually have concrete goals uh, but that is something that I always try to do is, is say, what am I making sure that I do with this piece? What are some things that I definitely want to make sure that I do? Yeah. Yep. That is a, that's how I tend to think about it as well. <clears throat> and I don't know for this piece, it's just about, Really knowing the beach and the and the waves crashing into the beach were going to be the most challenging part for me. I, I think it's about trying to master that that sense of value and the reflection of the sky in the little puddles of water, but um, just making that convincing, I guess, so that those puddles don't look like they're floating or like out of place. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's that's what I think about water is it's pretty easy to, to paint water if, I mean, like the, the way it is in my painting, there's some rock masses that are uh, coming in front of it 
and you're kind of seeing through them a window of this water and it's got some reflections, but you really don't see up close anywhere that the water is interfacing with the land where that surface tension is giving way to pebbles and stuff. Uh, all of a sudden you've got a real challenge on your hands, especially, you know, if you're trying to simplify it, you know, on a small canvas like that and still make it feel like that natural, you know, boundary. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely challenging to get the little things accurate that sell the illusion, basically. Yeah. Yeah, another one of the things that I set a, uh, as a goal uh, tonight for this piece is uh, with the, the, these land masses as they get farther off in the distance. Uh, another thing that happens in real life is things get cooler, bluer as they get farther away. And, you know, with the color scheme that I'm doing uh, on this piece, it, it's a little tricky to do that, but I still want to try at least to see what happens with uh, if I go cooler with these farther back things. If I can pull that off without losing the sunset vibe. Yeah. Yeah, and I find with my landscape painting, you, you can afford to make things much bluer than it's like, Yeah, I'm sorry. Somebody, uh, if people are talking in the background, um, I mean, you're welcome to join the conversation, but if you're just talking in the background, you might want to mute your mic. Uh, but uh, I'm sorry, Nick, what were you saying? Uh, um, about going bluer, right? You can go bluer than you would in real life or, or, or what? Yeah, you can thinking? usually, I've found in paintings, you can afford to go bluer than you think you can. Okay, for those, right, yeah. For those distant objects, it feels weird at first, but um, it looks it looks convincing if you let yourself go a little bit bluer. Yeah, and of course, if you're consistent with it across the whole piece, then then that's when it, it pulls together and starts to look natural. Yeah. So, Gabe, are, there, are you back on yet? Uh, yeah, well, I've been. I'm still monitoring. I'll be back in front of the computer in about uh, two or three minutes. Okay. Um, yeah. But do you guys know any of the? Uh, I was looking up for the uh, art history section. Some of the painters that do the uh, the translucent water kind of you know madness. It seems like there's some people from uh, maybe the turn of the century that were you know masters at that kind of stuff. Does that ring a bell or any particular names that I could track down? Hmm. I don't know if I know of any classical artists whose uh, water was in particular, you know, I mean, I, you know, Maxfield Parrish, any, ah. any kind of landscape stuff that he did was, was just dynamite. That, you know? That's, that's the, I think that might, or, yes. Awesome. That's, uh, I will, I'm adding that to my list as we speak. And he's also uh, a guy who was really big on, on having the right reference and he would build, sculptures or you know models of cliffs that filled his entire garage and little houses and stuff that he could use as uh, uh references so and, and of course you all know i love doing stuff like that so when i find any artist in in history that's that's done any kind of model making or whatever i always take notice There's a photographer, Gregory Crudson. He he takes still photographs, but he built. I'm sorry, we just lost your sound. Builds out these movie sets. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you now. <clears throat> you got you got sound now. Yeah, I don't know what happened there, but uh, it's all wow. good. Well, I was talking about. Uh, this photographer, Gregory Crudson, who takes large scale f photographs, they're still images, but he builds out an entire like movie set um, to stage these photographs. So it, it's like the size of a massive like city block or larger, basically. And 
So it's taking your, you know, liking to build models to in an even more extreme state. Wow. Just for a still photograph. <clears throat> Amazing. Just one. Build all that just for one photograph? Or just a few or however many, I guess. So. Well, yeah, I so think he'll take over he'll 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 take over like an entire neighborhood and so um mm. he'll bring in the massive like lights on cranes that they use in movies and he'll it's basically like a movie set but for a still image it's insane i think the idea there is if you're doing something where you've pulled out every resource you're you're going deeper into it than any sane person ever would you know what i mean uh, yeah. Then you have a chance of of going somewhere and producing something that that's actually truly remarkable. Yeah, exactly. Well, if you want, in his case, if you want a natural looking photograph, I mean, there's no, and 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 you're not going to manipulate, you know, with Photoshop afterwards. Then there's no other way to do it. When I lived in um, Vancouver, I was uh, I modeled in a very much smaller version of something like that. It was like a whole day of just setting up one photo. Um, it was just a room, so not a whole neighborhood, but it was very trippy because the guy was very particular about every every little piece of jewelry that every person was wearing and how our legs were crossed or all this and I never actually end up getting to see the photo I'm realizing <laughs> mm -hmm. it'd be cool Yeah, you, you know, if you're willing to go into those kinds of places where, you know, you're going to have to steer your entire career in order to even accommodate it, you know, to find the resources to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they, you know, you, you know, the, the kinds of remarkable things that have been done and you can kind of, you know, figure out the ones that haven't, right? There's, there's room for, for some wild ideas that are almost out of reach, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, you can, if you can imagine it, if you can imagine, okay, you know, these resources, I think I could pull them together. I think I'm the right person for the job. Make this, <clears throat> this vision a reality. <clears throat> filmmakers you know the the kinds of crazy things that that they uh the the amount of resourcefulness required to make a movie mm -hmm. yeah movies are uh pretty incredible i i'm actually very impressed with a lot of movies like even computer animation uh, like rango when you look at how much time it takes to just create one character, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's why Rango is so fleshed out, you know, and, and every frame of it is has mm. got as much depth to it as uh, something would have if it were, you know, filmed for real because, you know, they wanted to make sure that it uh, stood up to close inspection. Right, yeah. Has I anybody I watched seen it. The Oh, sorry. No, you're fine. Go, go ahead. Um, has anybody seen the claymation? Um, it's the Adventures of Mark Twain. I think it's from the '70s. Yes. It was a full motion claymation. So good. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty spectacular. It's I've heard about it, but you can find the whole thing on YouTube. I think for free. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's worth a watch. It's pretty spectacular. Claymation right. is incredible. It's Another really cool. one, uh, a similar title, extremely dark and messed up. Uh, the Secret Adventures of Tom Thumb. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah anyone seen that? Yeah, that's uh, 
That's some crazy. There's actual like biometric torture sequence in it. You know, it's it's nuts. Uh, cool. Well, very that? dark. Adventures of Tom Thumb. The Secret Adventures of Tom Thumb. Yeah. Okay. Sounds like an airplane taking off somewhere. <laughs> oh, that would be uh, Gabe making tea, is my guess. <laughs> Serious tea. <laughs> Definitely realizing how much I should uh, go shopping for some more paint colors. I've just got very basic, and I can see where I'm missing the ones that you had there, Nick, and the difference that it's making in my color scheme. <laughs> oh, I'm having to. Yeah. Kind of make it up as we go. What colors are you working with? Um, oh goodness, what is it? There's like uh, ma some sort of magenta. It's the pinks that I'm finding issues with. I've got perelian red and quinacridone violet instead of that uh, alzerian. Alizarin. Yeah, quinacridone is not that far off from alizarin, but alizarin is definitely warmer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And then uh, there's a couple others that are a little different, but it's like, it just means a little bit more <laughs> past petting it over top and finding out how to blend them. It's a good exercise in resourcefulness. Yeah. <laughs> In a perfect world, you end up in a place where you just can kind of follow your intuition and just say, I'll just add this and, and yeah. it'll it'll get it there. Oh, that didn't do it. Okay, I'll add this. And exactly. you know, you'll you'll be able to just sort of steer it there. Yeah, and I find if you just keep painting you don't give up on it right away then it just ends up doing something really cool and ends up looking better and better just gotta be patient yeah so i'd be curious uh how many people there are in our group here who have had the experience of trying painting and getting frustrated and are kind of in a place where you're trying to get past that and that's that's sort of like why you're here i'd love to hear from you if this is this is your situation i mean i get frustrated and <laughs> during every painting yeah <laughs> yeah i know what you mean yeah it, it's it's always a, an exercise of problem solving for, um, a lot of the way. Mm -hmm. That's really all it is. <laughs> well, and you know, one of the problems is us, right? And, and our mm -hmm. own doubt. And, uh, and of course, in the course of working on, on a painting, you're going to have part of it where, you know, the brush strokes you're putting down appear to <laughs> taking it where you want it and you're happy and it's looking good. And then you're like, Hmm, I, I need to lighten this whole area. And you work it and you're like, Oh man, I just fucked yeah. it. Right. Yeah. Uh, and that's natural. That'll happen. Right. And uh, in fact, I've kind of come to recognize and I'm like, ah, there's that moment, right. The hump, the hump mm -hmm. is just sort of like inevitable. It's part of the process of, doing anything even a tattoo right uh there's a, at least a mini hump in each one uh every every project is a sort of a hill you know and and every hill has got a hump at the top and and you'll recognize when you're there because that's that moment when it feels like yeah you know maybe it would be nice if i didn't have to finish this you know <laughs> <laughs> maybe it'd be nice if i could put down this wheelbarrow and just you know <laughs> walk away from this right yeah. uh, but uh but if instead of of reacting that way you say oh yeah there it is that familiar thing the the hump i'm at the hump uh 
that, that's been my gambit. You know, I just uh, I try to recognize when I'm at the hump and just say, oh, yeah, there it is. It's a landmark in this process. I know it's going to happen because I'm making a piece of art. And, you know, yeah. that hump is inevitable. Sometimes less so than others. And sometimes it's less uh, crippling, sometimes more. But uh, by just recognizing it and identifying it as a natural landmark that you're sure to see in one form or another, I think it's a little bit less of a, oh man, I think I might have to give up. Instead, it, it might feel like something that, oh yeah, I can definitely push through this. I know I, I knew it was coming. Totally. So I am back in front of the computer with the hot chocolate. And I can- All right. Are you all feeling ready to show off your pieces? Yeah. Sure. All right. Okay. Sandy's first. All and, right. Uh, if you could <clears throat> also let us know how to find you while people are looking at your work. Okay. So once again, the colors are a little bit off on here, but um, yeah, I'm feeling okay about it. This is much warmer in person. Everything's a lot warmer in person. Oh, you're looking at it in your screen and, you know. Yeah, <laughs> like that is definitely Wait a minute. color. <laughs> But the, yeah, Nick, I'm definitely feeling you on this part being very difficult to make look like the beach is just having yeah. weight coming up. That's a tough yeah, one. there's some subtle, some subtle stuff you got to be able to pull off there to really get that. So that's my struggle as well. Yeah. Yeah, coming, coming along good, though. And, and uh, yeah. Sandy has just recently started using oils. She was been an acrylic person until... Uh, what, four or five months ago? Yep. <laughs> and uh, cool. I'm barely an acrylic person. I was barely painting. And so this has definitely been enormous for my painting abilities. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, All right. Leo. We've got Leo next. How's it going? Awesome. Uh, I'm still, okay. still working on, uh, I haven't, <laughs> been able to work on it since last week when we got together on Sunday, so I'm still kind of dialing in this. Uh, see the glare on there, but can you uh, take your camera? Can you take your phone camera off and uh, give us a little bit of a, bit of a... tour? Yeah, nice. I'm, I've got a iPad, so I'm manipulating this giant thing right now. Hold on. <laughs> there the we go. Slower you can go, clearly the, the slower the better. Yeah. So uh, trying to yeah. dial in some glazing tonight on that tree branch. And uh, now I'm starting to put in some foliage around. Yeah, the so, problem with that is where do you even stop, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I just want to put a hint of it and then I'm going to move on to the beast. Because <laughs> again, it was like Nick was talking earlier, like, you know, when do you when do you walk away from it or or dial it back mm -hmm. and that's, that's one of my difficult that's one of my constant struggles yeah like it's kind of funny because it, what would you want someone to look at first yeah exactly i mean that guy the, <laughs> the yeah. creature so, right so now you've got to make him even more dialed in than all that crazy stuff yeah, or I'm or hoping, use some atmosphere glazes to push that stuff. You know, yeah, yeah. simpler. Yeah, <clears throat> and it's something I've uh, I started a uh, drawing for a class I'm going to take in March. And one thing that I'm really trying to keep in mind is okay, these are my focus. Be these are my focuses in this piece. Everything else needs to be secondary you know uh, so again you know i've been working on this for a while and i'm starting to realize man i'm getting i've gotten a, a little crazy with everything <laughs> <laughs> oh it's funny because you know your uh your tattoo style is the opposite you know mm -hmm. it's, it's it's very very much you know it's very tattooy you know yeah 
mm-hmm. it's clean and simplified and, and uh, you know, kind of like careful shape optimization and, and very spare detail. And that's something I had to work hard at <laughs> with tattooing because <laughs> in my earlier <clears throat> career, I just got way, I tried to do what I was doing with my paintings and it was too much. Mm-hmm. So maybe and now I, I need to carry to that back into my painting. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Leo, you you and Rain are going to be leading a fantasy art jam on, a, on one of these upcoming Sundays, correct? Yeah, mid-January, I think the 17th. Awesome. Oh, right. Have we set on a time for that? or? We haven't. We, I know we ha- we're settled on the date, but we haven't talked oh. about a time yet. Well, we well nine o'clock Eastern has been our sort of traditional start time for these things. I don't know. I'm fine with that. that. I mean, it's not great for the Europeans, uh, but uh, I think for people that are actually still working, uh, you know, it's Sunday, so most tattooers who are working are going to be done by nine o'clock. Mm-hmm. But of course, that's Eastern. So, like, you're <laughs> are you Pacific or Mountain? Time? I'm Mountain, so that's seven o'clock for me. Yeah. Okay. Which is perfect for me. Awesome. Sounds like it's a done deal. Okay. The, uh, January 17th at 9 Eastern. And, yeah, looking uh, forward to it. Yeah, that'll be awesome. Cool. Let's see here. So, who's next up on the uh, highlight? Uh, Melissa, Sink. Spotlight for everyone. All right. Hola. Something new here. Oh, sweet. Beautiful. Yeah. Little Oregon scenery. We get this yeah, wonderful. We have this wonderful sky that gets super grayed out when it's really rainy and whatnot. So, um, with all the wildfires and stuff we had over the summer, this is kind of like one of those spots that people went to to go um, swimming and whatnot. There's more like private area, like pools. Um, so, just kind of wanting to play with that. This is um, it's a lot of fun. It's been a while since I did some landscape. Hey, you nailed that distant part. Still working Perfect. on it though. <laughs> like these trees here are a little bit close. They're like mid ground. Um, mm-hmm. So I've got to pull in some more detail and layer in, but yeah. and then this is, this is a waterfall here that comes forward. Tell you what, though, you can almost, you know, it's so hazy in the, in the background that I instantly feel the raininess. It's pretty mm-hmm. effective that way. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're cool. Okay. Now we'll try to get Oliver on next. So, Oliver, uh, I did mute you because there was, oh, wait. So Oliver, we are going to ask to unmute you while your camera's getting uh, turning on and everything, and we could highlight Seth next. Spotlight for everyone. Yeah. It's uh, I, t- oh, wow. I I came in real late, so I was just trying to put something down that I can work with, but I'm still. I'm still trying. This is my reference, but okay. I'm kind of. I got my canvas a little too wet, so my oranges are getting too. My the weight on the top, and so I just kind of putting in more white to kind of give the water look. And yeah, you know, and kind of what, one way to avoid mud in situations like that sky is that you would actually put the orange area down first and then uh, yeah, was, around it. Uh, but you yeah. can still get in there right now with a, a paper towel and blot up some of those dark colors and, and you might then be able to put down the orange. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll definitely try that. I just wanted to try to do something. I've been contemplating doing some, so this is a good excuse to uh, not excuse, I guess a good reason to try to do some more because I look up to everything Nick does and I see it all the time. It's awesome. I've been following you for a long time. So just being able to paint with you and kind of listen to what you're talking about definitely helps. But even though I started late, Mm -hmm. 
Hey, late is better than than never, right? Yeah, man. Yeah. Just definitely. just taking the time out to be here is you know is is the important part. A lot of the time, we've got people in our group who have like not had time to like clean up and eat. You know, but it's like yeah, <laughs> you know, just finished work. They're here. They're they're doing it. Yeah, you just try to do some get into it so you can be a part of it. So, uh, Oliver, as soon as uh, you click on unmu- you want to click on mute, can you unmute and maybe turn your camera to the side? Yeah. What's that? What time is it in? Oh, it doesn't have an exact end, but they're, they're going through and showing everyone. Oh, we're almost there. There we go. Okay. I know that it's late for you, so uh, I'll spell you next. <laughs> Yes, perfect. Oh, yeah. Nice. Oh, hell yeah. Huge. Almost a mural. Hmm. Oh, nice. Very nice. Yeah, it looks amazing. What medium? I'm acrylic. Okay. I, I, I make it very thin in a kind of I think mm-hmm. and have set something like I do the tattooing uh, three or four mixes and try to come from the make the background first and then I try to work it out from the background and I work with a little trick uh, with a little uh, projector I make a little drawing on an iPad and then I project it on a I make a photo of the background and then I draw on the photo on the iPad in Procreate. And then I protect it on the background and um, I make the lines with a, with a marker. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's kind of different. Uh, I see everybody of you uh, working with oil. So, um, yeah, it's a different approach. Yeah, yeah, ink wash. Yeah, ink wash, yeah. But it's uh, on a canvas. Oh, okay. You okay. question on canvas. Nice. Yeah. Yes, like uh, acrylic, but um, like a medium thickness. Like not really, really thin, but not thick. And I have some oil colors. Maybe on the, on the end, I go with the oil color a little bit on top. Okay. To yeah. But I have to try. Awesome. Okay. Right. Thanks again for staying up wicked late or, or getting up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Honor, no uh, it's a, it's a it's honor, honor for me. <laughs> I'm a big fan <laughs> of you. Good party. Yeah, yeah. Good party. Okay, now we've got uh, T Von. All right. Hey. Yeah. Nice. So, what have we got here? So, yeah, it's just a bit of a cloudscape, and then it's got. You can't really see probably on the painting, but it's got like a telephone pole. Okay, yeah. Through here and some some wires, and then another one, and then some buildings. Yeah, down down towards the bottom, and then. So some this trees. is. Yeah, yeah, I can kind of see the silhouette of the of the landscape. So there's really yeah. some intricate kind of information you're getting down there. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty much just gonna kind of focus on trying to get the uh, the clouds to be, uh, you know believable i guess and then i'll go through and do the uh the silhouette and stuff but uh, i don't know if you guys can see that but that's the uh the reference oh, yeah. yeah yeah fairly complex cool. i mean it's almost explosive yeah yeah, oh. yeah. but yeah there's a picture i took yeah nice yeah okay. well i i wish you luck with that one that's definitely going to be uh <laughs> Yeah, I'm. I'm not planning on finishing it tonight. Yeah, yeah. But <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So you're up next, guy. Oh yeah, it's all shiny. So let me see if I can hold this. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I've just been mostly working the sky. I've I've painted this in with oil and I've just been kind of put, putting colored glazes over landscape 
elements, but the sky is getting a pretty thorough pass and I'm possibly going to end up losing most of my night there because, uh, you know, to really make it look good, especially looking at Nick's painting and how creamy and smooth everything looks. I just, I feel like it needs that. So uh, that's where I'm mostly focusing. I got to try out that fan blender. Nice. Yeah, you know what? I think that uh, that's one of the places where you get into the difference between liquid and uh, linseed oil. Even with that 45-minute break, this is pretty firm, you know? It's, it's yeah. winter time, and we've got a heater cranking over here, and it just, uh, man, it's almost almost dry. Wow. Yeah, and you know what? You just reminded me. I didn't start using fan blender brushes until I stopped using liquid and just got and just started using straight uh, linseed oil. Oh, uh, there you go. And, uh, back to you, Nick. Um, okay. So now you're, you're doing close detailing, right? So I'd love to see that. Yeah. So, yeah, I've been dialing in the uh, rocks along the beach here. It's getting a little bit better, a little more realized. Um, probably needs maybe like 20 more minutes of just fine fine tuning some of the little reflections in, in the pools and finding the edges of the rocks a little better. Um, and then the only other spot to really resolve is like the foreground waves because those are just kind of roughed in right now. But I, I, I need to really find the edge of those waves and make sure that shadow is a little more dialed in than it is now but um oh yeah and then add, add a little bit of grass right here but that's just a few little flicks with a paintbrush and that'll look great so yeah, the majority of the work is just, is just right in here oh. very nice and of course this is a you know the the colors the sky everything would be something you just wouldn't be able to capture plain air because it's such a transient thing. Yeah, so when I do paint a plain air sunset, um, I wanna get on location actually prior to sunset and get, um, get everything kind of blocked in and know, you know, use a compass on my phone to orient myself so I know where the sun's gonna be and kind of leave that part and then just blast that in like as it's happening. Okay. So, yeah. <clears throat> that's how I've done some sunset plane airs where I've managed to capture it pretty, you know, pretty nicely, but you got to really prepare and you got to paint very efficiently. And it's definitely, it's like a very uh, technical process basically. Yeah. When I talk about painting skies, I would like to try to approach it uh, from a less technical and more expressive way, you know, and, uh, see if I can just throw down all the clouds in 20 minutes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, mm, yeah. You know, and, and uh, then maybe as the sky is fading, I can, you know, do the foreground silhouette trees or whatever. Um, are you familiar with William Hawkins? He paints uh, a no. lot of skies. No, I'm not familiar. Okay. Yeah, very, very energetic, chunky fast sort of look uh <clears throat> and i don't know maybe he spends more time on it than it looked like it but uh you get the the sense that uh it's it's a fairly quick process and uh that a lot of these uh probably are i don't want to say speed painted but you know when you're painting these things in uh, in person it really you know the the pressure is on yeah and so you think he's not blending at all he's he's just painting a la prima just um just applying without without moving it around and smoothing it correct yeah yeah it's really not very it's not a blended look yeah it's tough to do i mean that dude's probably painted hundreds of those things to to be able to just chunk it on and not have to move it around at all you know in the six months i've been following he's painted hundreds of those things it's it's <laughs> pretty impressive today. Hey, is this uh, is this going to be going on for a little while? Or are people going to wrap this up? Or um, Nick, how much longer do you think you've got? 
Uh, I, I could spend another half hour on this, but I could, we, you know, we could also end it whenever, whenever oh, we've good. got all the time in the world. Yeah. Cool. So I think Nick's looking at, you know, relatively soon finish. Right. Uh, I yeah. mean, I, I could, I could paint all night here uh, because of, you know, I don't have a reference to match and I'm just kind of beating on it until it uh, feels right. And also that's a significantly larger uh, canvas than what Nick is uh, doing. Awesome. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to step away for a minute and I'm going to try and come right back. But if I, for some reason, I'm not back by the time this ends, uh, this has been awesome. Right on. Well, it's been awesome yeah. having you. And uh, if, if not this one, uh, we'll see you at the next one. Absolutely. We'll see you tomorrow for sure. Uh, thank Thanks, you, Nick. Yeah, I'll thank yeah. you, too. <clears throat> All right. Well, I might see you guys back here in just a little bit. but Excellent. Yeah. Cheers. All right. Late. All right. I think I'm actually going to sign off as well. Um, but thank you so much, Nick and Guy and Gabe and everybody. It's been a lot of fun. Right on. Well, Thank as you. always, great having you. Yeah. Have yeah a good thanks night. for being Can't here. Wait see... Can't wait to see everybody's finished stuff posted up later. Are we um, having a special hashtag for that? Uh, yeah, we probably should. Uh, I think that uh, at least a few of you besides Sandy are, are painting Nick's reference, right? Or is Sandy the only one? <laughs> I think she's the only one. Okay. <laughs> Maybe there's some people uh, in the chat that didn't come into the Zoom that are doing it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we we often will use the reinventing drawing group hashtag if uh, we don't come up with something else. There's always that. All right. That's been growing All pretty, uh, pretty steadily. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. Thanks. Welcome, Nick, Sandy. Good night, guys. Cheers. Hey, take care. Okay. Yeah, clouds are one of those things that uh, it's they can be very intricate, very detailed, and at the same time, you you have to make sure that amidst all that detail, you don't end up making them look too solid. You know? Yeah, they are very challenging. It's way too easy to make a cloud look cheesy like a like a kid's you know drawing where you just make this like puffy shape this generic like round puffy shape yeah I, I, so it goes, i'm trying to go real uh, i'm probably trying to go darker than i should have i've done more lighter clouds than these ones well and like you know the way i'm painting them I, you know, i'm trying to create these movements of them but the way that they like break apart and and uh scatter and that sort of thing uh still feels very contrived you know working without a reference uh and just trying to come up with it you know it's it's one of those things that looked fine when it was rough but now that i'm starting to really dial it in you can really see the shortcomings in and how unnatural some of them look so i mean i'm okay with it letting this be a little bit of a stylized painting. Yeah, I think you're in the fantasy genre and, and, I, and yeah, I think that works. Uh, yeah, I, I love that, that's really cool. I think that's a little, probably more free. Not really tied down to try and make it Right. Yeah. Yeah, of course. And uh, I'm all about that. But there's that part of me that just wants to be able to nail it, you know, and and so when when you're doing something from your imagination, you can give it more realism without a reference. Yeah. You know, like every time I build a model for the bio stuff, 
I'm able to do things without models a lot better. So I always pick up a little something, usually something very specific, uh, some twist or a turn that I hadn't gotten before. Yeah. When you do something, a lot of it tends to fight you. Here you can see the shape. Well, and with something like bio, it's like a, it's a shape language, right? And each of us, you know, everyone who does bio has their own sort of shape language and it's very easy to get habitual, you know, and, and you start to just draw things the same way over and over again. And, uh, yeah, that's one thing I always try to avoid and push it forward a little bit each, each year. You change it. Well, I collaborate with a lot of other artists and, as, you know, partly in an effort to keep things moving along. Of course, that didn't really happen very much in 2020. A little bit, but... Uh... Not as much as it should have. No, man, the stuff that got canceled. Spring 2020 was just going to be such a killer, uh, you know, season of collaborations. I mean, I had to ruin it. There. I don't want to sound like a complainer, though. You know, I think I think about my own life and, uh, you know, how, how bad it's been for some. Uh, I really have no place to complain. And actually, uh, I don't want to sound weird or anything, but this year has actually been pretty good for me. Uh, you know, I've had a chance to branch out, try new things, you know, the, uh, the whole thing with, uh, you know, all these zoom calls and, and, you know, online activities with people has, I mean, that's not something I bothered to do before, you know, uh, it's, it's a lot of effort and, uh, there has to be a good reason. And then all of a sudden we've got this really great reason. And by the time we have something assembling, uh, you know, resembling normalcy, uh, it will be so smooth at doing this and practiced and, you know, it'll be part of our habit, you know, it'll be easy to do. Right. Uh, yeah. This is just a new, a new, uh, resource. So yeah, it's, it's been, uh, been a great time to, to kind of take a plunge into, uh, into this, this whole thing. Um, uh, and I kind of felt because I'd stopped doing conventions that, uh, with the exception of the artists I was collaborating with, it was, you know, kind of hard to, to feel as connected to the tattoo community as I used to when uh, Michelle and I were frequent convention goers. Jack, yeah, you're not being meet, like actually physically talking to people. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, it's not so much, I mean, physically talking to people, I mean, that's nice, right? I mean, definitely way better than this. But uh, at the same time, the thing about this that's cool is uh, there's a random factor to it. You know, uh, I don't know who I'm going to meet. You know, I'm, I'm going to meet new people. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to get yeah. into conversations with people I've never talked to before, just like I would if I was uh, hanging around at uh, uh, the after party at a convention. Right. Uh, and, uh, and I like that it's, it's scratches that itch at least a little bit. And, uh, you know, part of me enjoys the, the solitude of, of, uh, you know, this rural lifestyle and everything, but there is a part of me that's always wanting to, uh, connect with my artist peers. And, uh, you know, obviously this whole educational thing that I do, I must like it, you know, I must like talking to people. So yeah. uh, this is, this has been a great new format to be able to do that in. Well, I think that's important. That's important. Education part of it. And of course, we're also, you know, we're educating a child right now and, and thinking more like educators in some sense. And, and uh, I like the fact that 
this is the kind of group where she can be tuned in and, and, you know, uh, it's, you know, fairly serious study going on. And, but we're still enjoying ourselves. You know, I think that's the thing that, that kids need to see is parents, you know, you know, grownups having a good time doing grown up stuff that happens to be creative and cool. It, it gives them a hope, you know? Yeah. Well, my, my dad told me if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Oh. <laughs> sure. It's like I've been having fun eight hours a day. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely fun. At least since I oh, wait, wait. started tattooing. <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt. I didn't know if I did or not. Yeah, there's actually a couple of things I'm working on right now. Uh, those of you who are tuned into the drawing group that Jason Lisa was leading earlier today I was working on this sort of wacky waterfall landscape thing that Killian Moon and I are doing. And it's very much at this point a uh, a depth of field problem, you know, because it's this complex landscape and I'm trying to nail the value in each layer of the landscape so that it locates itself, you know, at the right depth in space. And uh, it's a pretty tricky thing once you really, you know, when you're relying on value alone to, to spell out depth, uh, you really have to nail it. But I'm finding that I'm sort of running into that same issue with these, these clouds. I, I feel like I really want them to be the right distance away in space. And, you know, I've got these mountain ranges here that are lighter than the clouds and the clouds are farther than the mountains and yet i want to have enough contrast in them that the color looks rich and uh you know the the sunset is able to have the, the dynamic range that it needs it's real tricky to run into boxes like that like being being boxed in with certain choices you have to make. Definitely. Yeah. Have, that definitely happens a lot in, in, in tattooing, but sometimes with painting, like you just described, for sure, I find myself in those boxes like, all right, something has to give. And another thing that uh, uh, I struggle with when I do skies is my tattooer's reflexes, where I, things have to be dialed in and specific. You know, everything needs to be, you know, purposeful. And it's hard to let myself just let things get a little mishy mashy here and there. And sometimes that's exactly what's needed. And, uh, of course, when you've got uh, a number of elements that, that are loose, then the tight things stand out more, you know, and if everything's tight, then it's harder to make anything the center of interest. Yeah. And of course, you know, you've got a little bit of the advantage of working with a photo reference that, uh, you know, the camera naturally, you know, forces a choice on itself. And, and, you know, either if it's an autofocus, it's going to choose something that seems, you know, it's, it's making guesses about the, the user's intentions. There's a face, it focuses on the face or whatever. Uh, but you usually end up with a lot of stuff that just doesn't have that much detail. The camera just kind of defaults to that really have to have a, a very uh, 
tiny aperture and a long exposure if you want to have everything detailed. So usually it doesn't look that way. And, and uh, when you're trying to come up with it just out of your imagination, it's a little bit harder to filter like that. And I've even forced myself to just use this like half inch brush for everything, but even that is not uh, proven uh, enough of a simplifying factor. Well, and what you just said, Guy, what you just said actually is perfect, applies perfectly to plain air painting. Um, mm -hmm. When you're taking in the, the, the entire landscape with your own eyes and you can really just see like every single tree, every branch on every tree, because you can just dart your eyes around and have them focus on every little thing that you want them to focus on. Um, it's very challenging when you're first getting into plain air painting to know when, where, and how to strategically simplify what needs to be simplified. And even to accept that you're not losing anything important. It's like, oh man, this whole scene is so beautiful. I want to capture it all. And anything less is just going to be diminished. Yeah. And instead accepting that it's that, that narrowing down that filtering that makes the painting interesting. Well, yeah, and ironically, at times, if, if you do it right, it actually makes it more realistic, too, because in our normal lives, the way we look at things is we don't record every detail of every object. We glance over and our brain computes the things we care about. Right, yeah, it'll, it'll fill in the foliage on the trees and that kind of thing. And, and, uh, yeah, once our brain recognizes our eyes looking at a tree, it knows what a tree is, and you don't actually count every leaf on every tree you look at. I, I want to say that I've seen, I don't know if it was you or somebody was doing some re, like paintings and uh, like looking at the scene, like you're talking about doing it on there and they would set up a camera to go back to or just a live camera to look at so you can look at it in a picture or instead of just like you said, just looking at everything and seeing everything because you're going to focus on things that you find interesting or whatever, just to t step back and take a look at the whole picture using a screen to do that or some sort of uh, way to maybe boxing your hands so you can just look at everything instead of one thing or focusing on one thing, getting lost. Yeah, I mean, the blurring your eyes a little bit is another another thing that I mean I often have my eyes blurred and I just let them snap into focus occasionally. Yeah, I was, yeah, was going to say I that as it. well, just like squinting, basically. I don't know uh, who has could have been a video I watched a uh, guy a uh, uh, Jeff. Uh, go away. Is that how you say it? Or I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah. You got it right. He, he uh, says that in a couple of videos to, to focus on or to have something that's really focused and then the, last, the rest is just lost or like not so focused, but it's enough to make you, your brain make it that way because your brain's going to automatically fill it in. So you have like a background that's blurry, but in the right, and all this stuff is in the right spot, it's going to make sense. Because <laughs> your brain's going to make it make sense. Yeah, well, it, it's, uh, it kind of mimics the, like, you know, of course, if you look around, everything appears as you're looking at it to be sharp. But if you just glance at a whole scene, that's, you're not looking around and recording all the detail, you're just getting kind of an impression of the whole scene and you might only really focus your eyes on you know the the center of interest whatever it is that uh you're really looking at you know let's say you're about to take somebody's photo that's standing in front of the grand canyon you know uh you're not taking in the entire canyon although you're getting an impression of it yeah And so, you know, a really experienced landscape painter, you know, part of their, their thing is they're able to get a clear impression and simplify it, you know, and, and uh, 
you know, I think a lot of the time they're just identifying what makes it attractive to them. What, what are the features of what they're seeing that are worth putting in the painting? Yeah, that make it translatable. I think that's why I still have some issues with because I get lost in where I'm working or what I'm looking at. I have to try to step back and look at it differently. This might look better from a distance or in a different way than it does when looking at it real close. And sometimes also you need to just step away from it and come back later. That's that's another thing that uh, can be really useful. Yeah, I've found that I like some of my pictures later than I do at the moment. Right. Well, because at the moment, not we're not just looking at the picture. We're comparing it against whatever expectations we might have dangled in front of ourselves when we first got started and said oh yeah i'm going to accomplish this and this is how happy i'm going to be and this is how good it's going to be and, uh, and this is roughly how it's going to look and and then of course we're looking at the thing and, and it might feel disappointed even if it's a good piece right it's you know we're talking about goals and setting goals for ourselves you know sometimes you might produce a good piece but that just doesn't necessarily meet those goals but then you know if you have enough time you might come back to it and say yeah you know it's a good thing i didn't meet those goals because this is better than that you know this is something that uh, actually kind of moved me forward a little bit and, and you know now i've got some new tricks and if i had yeah. you know merely met my expectations uh maybe not so much Well, I'm getting pretty close to my ending point here with this painting, probably another like 15 minutes I could spend on it before it's just kind of overkill. Yeah. Uh, so this is probably pretty typical for the amount of time you would put into a plain air or are those quicker because you're working in, in a more pressure kind of situation? Uh, no, th this is actually probably like the exact amount of time I'd put into a plain air. And I've tried to do this entire painting session tonight as if I was painting plein air. Okay. I guess so. <clears throat> are you doing a lot of your plein air in in Austin, or are you going somewhere else? The recent. I mean, ones? lately, lately in Austin, but I mean, I've done plein air all around the world at at, at this point. You can't really go much many places. I guess that would be kind of an obvious answer. Yeah, Where was the last one that you did? The What's most that? recent, I guess the more the more recent one you did, um, you posted just a couple days ago. Yeah. I just don't, I'm not familiar with the area where you paid. Was that a live air one or is that just one you just did? Um. um uh, based off a of reference the lake view yeah Did yeah that's the lake i live on so that's like the view from my porch oh nice okay perfect that lake uh, i'm trying to think what like there's several of them over there so lake travis like you're living right off of lake travis yeah that's, a, that's an awesome lake. That's an amazing lake. Yeah, that doesn't suck, right? No, no not no, at all. Definitely not. not. I'm from, I've been around there for a long time. So I know I, we used to just drive uh, down the roads. I like try to just look at the houses in the, in the lake itself. I and mean, there's some amazing houses out there. That's another piece of art, architecture. I definitely... Uh, love is like people like building I do, I do a little bit of building myself carpentry work definitely takes uh, artistic eye to do that 
Yeah, for sure. At, at a high level, absolutely. Or even, you know, I mean, I feel like a lot of the stuff we've done around this house is, has definitely been, you know, I mean, approached from an artistic eye. Uh, I mean, not that I'm great at it or anything, but uh, yeah, I mean, even just this past week, uh, I've been working on our basement and uh, Michelle and I, for a long time, we, we were subscribers to this magazine, Dwell. Uh, it's sort of a modern architecture magazine. And yeah. And, you know, we used to get ideas from that. It was all for rich yeah, people, you know, and, and so a lot of the stuff is like, yeah, if you want to spend $12,000 on a lamp, but, you know, you get cool ideas and then you find somebody in your circle that's like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll make something kind of like that for some tattoo credit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, and I do, we, me and my wife, we do a lot of that. A, a lot of the walls I build are not necessarily perfectly straight square walls or um, a normally octagonish or a di way different than like your typical room or because I, I bought a, a huge building in east texas it's like downtown so we can turn it into our living space and also our my studio my tattoo studio and uh i'm able to just build our my things the way i'd want to build them which are not <laughs> not normal yeah well, that's, that's always fun right why be normal yeah no because it adds more something to look at and like live i use a lot of cedar the live edge cedar and for my countertops and my trim instead of just regular normal trim and your baseboards and stuff like that or a lot of crown molding different types of stuff like that i love doing that finish work and that type of stuff yeah that's the fun stuff for me yeah i, I deal with a lot of carpenters and they're like man i hate that stuff <laughs> like that's well because you got to be the most careful right yeah you got to keep everything really clean you want your edges to be your 45s or your you know everything that goes together if i was to choose anything in construction it'd be doing counter kitchens or trim work or finish work on that kind of stuff i would think the reason being is you're approaching it from an artistic standpoint and the people who say they don't like doing that stuff they're not approaching it from an artistic standpoint yeah yeah i guess that makes sense they're just looking at it as hard. Yeah. But it's satisfying. I mean, it's hard, but it's satisfying to do it right and have it done. I think the process of trying to figure out how to do it, because uh, almost all the crazy walls or things that I, that I try to make in that sector, you're not going to have like just a 45. It's going to be like a 15 degree angle or a 12 or a 12 and a half just to make it match all the way through and look well, which that's, that would probably be the hard part, I guess. It's funny. You know, when I do stuff like that, I often am so ghetto about it. I'll just, just, uh, you know, hold the boards and, you know, and in the angle that I think will look good and kind of make a rough mark. And just, you know, by the time everything's all said and done, I figure I can hide all that stuff behind drywall and just make it look smooth. <laughs> well, the drywall and stuff, yeah, yeah, that's when you're framing, that's you can get away with doing some stuff not so. But my a lot of my countertops are just two pieces of cedar put together with a with a live edge. Right, and it's you want to try to make that. Yeah, you got to try to make that live edge meet up real good and like look seamless. But you only have one chance, so I'll I'll do like several cuts on on just regular piece of wood to try to find my angle so i can make sure that the the top one the finish has got good full seams and they go together well and they don't have gaps or anything like that i would say my sheetrock work and my uh uh framing work is probably not the greatest that, I'll hide. I'm like, oh, look at that gap. I'll just go ahead and put a bunch of mud in there. <laughs> yeah. Well, 
you can do that. That's the thing. And sheetrock is just such a miserable some... thing. Might as well is. get through it. Just do whatever it takes to get through it. Yeah, definitely. Have you seen uh, sheetrock? There's artists that will, will people are do like scenes with um, the mud. Uh, yes, yeah, right. I saw I saw somebody who did a pretty big, very vertical mural that way. It was sort of like a, uh, the old uh, Japanese block print kind of look with, <clears throat> you know, bridges and very tall, uh, you know, tree covered mountains uh, rising yeah. out of the mist and then disappearing back into it. And it was, yeah, the relief effect was really cool. Yeah, that was awesome. I've seen a few uh, done with some animals and a few other things, some horses and stuff. Like sculpted them out of like just piles of mud and then, there's also this this yeah. artist that uh i couldn't tell you his uh real name but on insta he goes by surface system and uh he does crazy almost bio looking stuff that is it just smoothly flows up out of a wall and then turns into a series of these ribs with like lights hidden in them and stuff like that it's pretty pretty amazing stuff yeah, that's really cool. That, that's, that's the kind of stuff I want to do. On, I mean, I've only had this building I'm in for a couple of years, so I've really only been focusing on my studio and getting that ready. But uh, we, I have plans for certain rooms and areas that I'll do big vaulted like ceilings, but instead of them being normal straight edges, they'll be more organic, kind of like uh, HR did in his house. A lot of you know, HR Giger guy, is it? Giger, yeah. Giger. I don't know if you've seen, like, a lot of his furniture is custom made by him. He made himself. Right, yeah. It's real organic, and um, it's really cool looking, and it's not typical. No, no. It's also not something you could easily make, either. You have to have skills and resources. Yeah. I want to do a bunch of stuff like that. And then stained glass on all my, all the windows. Mm. Uh, handmade stained glass, just the images design. Something else I like to try to do. Yeah, that that is one thing about this house is it's, it's extremely, uh, quirky and handmade looking everywhere you look uh you know it's it's not not ritzy at all you know it's it's filled with with art and sculpture and even the architectural aspects of it are very quirky because you know we've we've either handled it ourselves or worked with friends who are down with our quirky ideas yeah and we've never really worried about resale value because yeah that's i'd hate to let that slow us down yeah well that i think is going to be better because i mean things change i think something like that would probably could potentially sell for more to somebody that's into that you might only have a certain group of people that would be interested in it but yeah well the main thing is is i don't have any interest in leaving so uh, you know we're think, we're pretty yeah. pretty dug in yeah. here, so we can completely throw all caution to the wind and not worry about resale value. I think that's the same boat I'm in. I don't intend on ever leaving. All right, so Nick, where are you at now? Uh, process uh, final drive. final five minutes here. Yeah doing some blades of grass in the foreground and um, they're going to call it done in a sec here. I also noticed that uh, right up against that rock face and maybe you had done this earlier and I just didn't notice. It seems like you've gotten some brighter highlights in the, in the water. Is that a here? recent addition? Uh, yeah. Here, yeah. Like here. The, basically the, the contrast between the water and the, uh, uh, the rock face just heightened, uh, is that a yeah. kind of a recent thing you're going through and adding highlights in the water? Um, up here, I left it 
Um, I put more highlights down here. Okay. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to see it up a little closer when you're done with your final five minutes. Yeah, just doing some blades of grass down here in the corner and then that's pretty much it. Yeah, I always like she... landscape images that show the distant all the way to the foreground, like right almost like in front of your feet. Yeah. So yeah. A, lot, a lot of times I'll try to throw in like a little corner like down here, how I have this like foreground in the corner just because it gives that illusion of scale and depth. Yeah. And, and you don't even need that much of it, just a, just a reference point. Yep. from Scotland's hanging in till the end. Right on, it's gotta be almost sun up over there. Frankie hey. uh, says stained glass is so nice, that's cool. Hector says saludo desde Mexico. Right on. Uh, Frankie says Lakeview, big flex. <laughs> I'm back as well. Oh, right on, welcome back. So yeah, I don't have a lake view, but Nick, we actually exposed, uh, cut down some trees and we can see our pond now from our house, which is kind of nice. And yeah, that's obviously not this kind of a scene, but at least we've got some water there. Yeah, that's amazing. Do you, do you guys still have like a beaver going, going down? Oh yeah. Yeah. The beavers are still active. Uh, I'm guessing it's the same family. And uh, yeah, it's they still wreck it up. Does that get on your nerves, or is that something that you just allow to happen? You know the, mean, the the trees, the specific trees that we don't want them to fuck up. We wrap them in tin foil. That's all it takes. Really? Oh. Yep. Yeah. Just uh, the, at the bottom, or wherever. Yeah, they, yeah. They just, would... just like eighteen inches of it. That's all you need. Uh, and we we've wrapped like some dogwood trees with tin foil for five years and and you know the beavers will come up to it and be like oh man i wanted to eat this but they just leave yeah. it alone and uh and beyond that That's you know i mean I, I like having them around and and uh even though they're not always convenient and sometimes they'll you know do stuff to the landscape that isn't wonderful but you know i don't want to be a control freak about it either because this is wilderness Right. And, uh, yeah. And, I, and they're, they're cool, you know, like, uh, it'll, it'll be two in the morning. And I'm walking up from the studio in the middle of winter and I hear, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, out of, out of the cold, you hear the tree come down. <laughs> so, oh, nah, no. man, you got him right when he was in the middle of the, the kill. And then, yeah, uh, yeah. We also have a family of vultures, and they're they're probably a little bit more noticeable. Like if many people who've been to hyperspace have uh, had the vultures hang out like on the studio stoop the entire time they're getting tattooed, and uh, oh, cool, <laughs> they're pretty neat. They they waiting for somebody to peel over. <laughs> yeah, yeah for the they, they won't bug you if you're alive, but uh, yeah, like one, one guy was. One guy was once just kind of laying there, uh, uh, waiting for me to finish pouring color. It's a beautiful morning, so he's just laying on the cement, and uh, and the vultures actually like gathered along the edge of the building, <laughs> just looked down at him, and they're like, Is he? "Oh no, nah, he moved." <laughs> uh, <laughs> they didn't get us that day. But they would live 50, 60 years, and uh, they mate for life. And it's very likely the same vulture family that's been here the whole time. And so even though they poop on the stoop, I'm still happy to have them around because I just think they're cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I feel the same way about the nature, too. But it, it, here, 
you get you hear a lot of people complaining about the damage from beavers oh, yeah. and stuff. There's definitely damage. I mean, when the beavers first showed up, uh, and they started, you know, wrecking stuff, and then they took over our second pond. And I was like, okay, that's enough. Uh, you got both ponds, uh, so. We ended up getting a trapper and, you know, Michelle and I are, are I mean, I've, I've been meatless since 98, you know, and, and so it's a big deal for us to do this. Uh, but this guy supposedly relocated all the beavers that he caught uh, and, uh, you know, in such a way that they could find each other. Now, I don't know if that's actually what really happened, but six months later, we had beavers again. <laughs> and so it was... Hmm. It's, when I just had to accept that this is a place that beavers are going to be. And uh, that, uh, it, as it turns out, their effect on the landscape has, you know, once they got past a certain point of, of, uh, of damage, it didn't seem to get any worse. So, yeah, it's, it's just, you know, it doesn't look like it's manicured and under control, but that's not what we're going for here. This is, uh, you know, this is the Shawnee National Forest. We've got our, our little moat area around our yard and the rest of it, we've kind of just let it do its thing. Yeah, we have a lot of uh, pretty random growth in Texas. Well, we're in East Texas and Austin, not so much. It's hard for me to even imagine Nick not being in Austin. He was an East Coast guy once upon a time. Oh, yeah. That's when I started following him. Connecticut? Yeah, before yeah. he came to Texas. Yeah, I have no, I have no desire to, to not be in the Austin area. So, I actually called you a long time ago. I don't know how long ago. At your studio wherever you work uh, I don't even remember where you worked because I was just curious I mean I was starting to figure out how to do really good tattoos but your tattoos were just amazing they've always been amazing uh that's how you how do you get your full how do you get it so saturated I think your answer was um no mercy <laughs> yeah <laughs> He's like, that's really all I could say. I really don't know how, what else to say. I was like, okay, well, I don't mean to be a fangirl or whatever, but definitely uh, was trying to figure out. There was a when I probably around when I first started, when mostly the work that I found was, or the way I could study was through like tattoo magazines and uh, just finding other artists through magazines and stuff like that because there wasn't really much social media i think that's how i found you I just was curious now you can just go on instagram and you can just yeah. look at or, people's work or youtube or something yeah so yeah the magazines have, magazines have almost disappeared you know we've got tattoo society but other than that if uh it's it's hard to remain relevant when yeah. you know everybody's getting an update once a day or many times a day, uh, right there in their pocket. Yeah, you don't go out and buy them like you used to. Mm -mm. All right. Well, my painting's done. All right. Let's see it up close here. Yeah. Sweet. Right. <clears throat> Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, the rocks in the foreground look almost photographic. I've seen on my screen here. That's a... Awesome. Yeah. That's yeah, cool. that's killer, man. Well, I'll just yeah, the color gradient, the 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 palette of the sky and uh, and water is uh, just really pleasing. You know, it's it's not a, a over the top sunset at all, but it's uh, really got just enough warmth to. Uh, you know, give it a nice feeling. 
very, very tranquil. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Well, thanks for sharing with us tonight, Nick. Uh, I yeah. hope we can we can do uh, uh, a, a still life with you at some point. Yeah, um, I'd love to. Right on. Yeah, we'll we'll talk uh, privately about that. Figure out the the right time. Um, yeah, this this winter we we gotta we gotta keep this stuff going. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, thanks so much for doing this, and uh, thank you everyone who showed up tonight and painted, and uh, anyone who tuned in and just enjoyed uh, uh, <laughs> listening to the banter here. I hope everyone learned something and got a little bit better at uh, at making your art. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Uh, once again, we got Jake Meeks in the morning. I'll try to pop in for the back end of that, but I'll definitely see you all uh, tomorrow night for our geological flow exercise at 9 p.m. Yeah. Awesome. And, Thanks, uh, everybody. I'm clicking the end meeting call button. Right on. Thanks.